Student National Assembly come back with the, the bill and they edit out what you don't like. Would this is sign it? I don't think I told them what I don't like. All I said, there should be, we must insist that it has to be direct. It should be consensus and indirect. So if they do that, would you sign it? Yes, I will. I will sign. All I would like to, uh, is that there should be options. You can't tell, you can't dictate to people and you said you are doing democracy. Allow them, uh, you know, uh, uh, so that they can make a choice. A constituency can come together and they say, okay, we pick Mr. A. My name is Samson Itodo, Executive Director of Yaga Africa. It's exactly 399 days to the 2023 general elections, and Nigerians still await the enactment of a new election legislation to enhance the integrity of the electoral process. Last month, the electoral amendment process was rendered inconclusive when President Buhari declined assent to the Electoral Bill 2021 and returned it to the National Assembly to remove the contentious clause of direct primaries. CSOs have also identified drafting errors and cross-referencing gaps in 11 sections of the bill that, if unaddressed, will cause controversies and legal complications. In a recent interview, President Buhari promised to assent to the Electoral Bill should the National Assembly remove the contentious clause. Nigerians clamor for the speedy conclusion of the electoral amendment process to facilitate early preparations and eschew legal uncertainties that make the electoral process susceptible to manipulation. As long as the electoral reform process is inconclusive, Nigeria is losing an opportunity to test the efficacy of new innovations introduced in the electoral bill, especially during the off-circle elections in FCT, in Ikiti and Oshun and before deployment for the 2023 general elections. It is for this reason that the Aiga Africa and our partners are hosting this town hall to highlight landmark provisions in the bill and to demand the speedy conclusion of the electoral amendment process ahead of the resumption of the National Assembly from recess. Tonight's town hall is an opportunity for stakeholders, especially you and I, to demand an electoral law that guarantees the sanctity of the vote. I therefore invite you to participate actively by sending a text message to 0903-800-7744. 0903-800-7744. Or send an email to watchingthevote at yaga.org or simply join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter using our handle Yaga or also using the hashtag FixElectionsNG. This town hall is viewed across the world and aired on Radio Nigeria Network Service, Ray Power, and other radio stations because we believe every voice counts. Present at this town hall this evening are representatives of key democratic institutions and citizens across the world. I'd like to thank all the EU SDGM partners, namely the European Center for Electoral Support, the Albino Foundation, the International Press Center, the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, Clean Foundation, the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, the Westminster Foundation, the Institute of Media and Society, the KUKA Center, and the Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism. Special thanks to the EU delegation in Nigeria for making this possible through the EU support to democratic governance in Nigeria. 
Lastly, please remember, it's exactly 399 days to the 2023 general elections. And to safeguard the integrity of the AKT, the Oshun and the 2023 elections, the National Assembly and the President should conclude the electoral amendment process by January 31st, 2022. On behalf of all of us, I say welcome to the Citizens Town Hall on Electoral Bill. Thank you. My name is Samson Itodo. On behalf of the European Union, I would like to thank you for this important and timely event. The European Union is a key partner and a steady supporter of Nigeria's vibrant democracy. Since 1999, we have followed Nigeria's elections working with all the actors of the electoral process. Because the strength of any country's democracy depends on the quality of its electoral process and on the mobilization of its citizens. And each electoral cycle is a unique opportunity to learn from previous experiences and to continue improving the process. This is not unique to Nigeria. All democracies around the world continue learning and adapting. And as long-term partners, the EU will continue to support Nigeria in advancing this objective. The European Union congratulates all the stakeholders that are engaged in the ongoing electoral reform process. A lot has been already achieved, but a lot also remains to be done. And we feel confident that today's town hall will contribute to the debate and to a successful conclusion of the process. At the invitation of the federal government, the European Union deployed in 2019, an electoral observation mission. Since then, significant efforts have been done to address the recommendations and improve the electoral process. We will continue in this endeavor. Our priority is, and will remain, to support the civil society community and all the actors of the electoral process to make Nigerian democracy stronger. Because what is good for Nigeria is good for the world. I wish you all a very successful discussion. My name is Samson Itodo. Twenty-one. Early release of election funds to IMAC. Clause three. The bill strengthens the financial independence of the Independent National Electoral Commission IMEC by ensuring that all funding required for a general election is released not later than one year before the next general elections. Inclusion of Persons with Disability, Clause 54. The Commission shall take reasonable steps to ensure that persons with disabilities, special needs and vulnerable persons are assisted at the polling place by the provision of suitable means of communication. Legalizing Electronic Accreditation of Voters, Clause 47. The bill makes provision for electronic accreditation of voters using smart card readers or any technological device as may be determined by INEC. Redefined overvoting, Clause 51. Redefined overvoting, Clause 51. According to the bill, overvoting occurs when the number of votes cast at an election in any polling unit exceed the total number of accredited voters in that polling unit. With this new provision, total number of accredited voters will become a determining factor in the validity of votes in an election. The outdated definition had been exploited by politicians to manipulate electoral outcomes. Substitution of candidates in the event of death in an election. Clause 34. The new bill addresses a lacuna in the current electoral law, which was manifest in the 2015 governorship election in Kogi State, where a candidate died before the result of that election was announced. The bill affords political parties the opportunity to conduct primary elections to replace a candidate who dies after the commencement of polls and before the announcement of final results and declaration of a winner. Power to review election results declared under duress. The bill confers INEC with the power to review declarations and returns made under questionable circumstances to keep returning officers in check and ensure full compliance with electoral guidelines. 
The provision will fundamentally transform the resort management process and deter politicians from compelling polling officials to declare fabricated election results. Early conduct of party primaries and submission of list of candidates, Clause 29. Every political party shall not later than 180 days before the date appointed for general elections submit the list of candidates the party proposes to sponsor at the election to the commission, who must have emerged from valid primaries conducted by the political party. Early commencements of campaigns. Clause 94. The period of public campaigns by political parties has been extended from 90 days to 150 days before polling day and end 24 hours prior to that day. Political neutrality of INEC personnel upon appointment and penalty for contravention. Clause 8. A person who, being a member of a political party, misrepresents himself by not disclosing his membership, affiliation, or connection to any political party in order to secure an appointment with a commission in any capacity, commits an offense, and is liable on conviction to a fine of 5 million naira, or imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years, or both. Electronic Transmission of Results, Clause 50. The bill confers INEC with the powers to determine whether election results are transmitted electronically or manually. All right then, it does look like we've set the stage for us to commence this conversation. You've uh, gotten uh, some kind of sense of what we're going to be talking about. You already were talking about it since last year. We're in a new year now, but there's a few things about this bill that you're not talking about tonight. Let's get started. Thank you so much, uh, gent uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Before I unveil the first panelist, uh, uh, set of panelists on the program, let me allow you to give us what is on the minds of Nigerians. I wanted us to have this short conversation before I bring on the panelists. First and foremost, what do you think is most critical that people are not talking about, aside the issue of the direct primaries? Because I know that will generate a lot of conversations tonight. Okay. One very critical aspect of the Electoral Bill 2021 is that unlike what we used to have, if, the law, if it's passed into law, there will be need for a list of candidates to be sent to INEC 180 days before the election. What do we have means, before now? Uh, before now, it's um, about 90 days to the election time. But if it's 180 days by this new electoral bill, it means that by August of this year, July, August, the list you get to INEC. And that means that if it's not already signed into law now, that means we have limited time. And most importantly also, Campaigns used to start 90 days before election in the current electoral hat. But with this electoral bill 2021, it's going to start 150 days before the general election. There are lots, lots of other factors within the electoral bill 2021 that we need to internalize. And generally, delaying the passage of electoral bill you know, it's not good for Nigeria's democracy. Right. Nigeria's democracy is critical to Africa and to the world. And we must all work hard to ensure that we do the needful and in time. Thank you. Are we making a mole out of all of this? Uh, because someone will ask, if this is not passed, is anything wrong with our elections? In the process of, I mean, the way and manner we conduct our elections, Cynthia? Well, I think it's important we know that we can't keep doing the same thing the same way and expect a different outcome. And the idea for these electoral reform process is to give us a new law that captures um, provisions that would ensure our processes are more credible <laughs> and that there is electoral integrity in Nigeria. And I think what is important is the fact that we've reduced this conversation to just issues around direct and indirect primaries. But there's a lot more. So if you think about early funding for elections, um, this current proposed bill provides for funding for elections to go to the electoral commission at least a year to the year. But now why is that important? If you think about our conduct of elections, previous elections, logistics, management, in fact the postponement of elections that we had in 2019, 2015, even 2011 were attributed to issues around elections operations and logistics and management. So when INEC receives the fund early, it gives INEC better time to plan. In 2019 elections, the funds for elections were really barely 
by January of the of the of the year of the elections, probably weeks to the elections. Now, how would we expect to, um, to conduct elections? So, and um, this proposed bill provides for the funds for elections to go to the I, to INEC early. Another important conversation, Shane. When I think we need to talk about is the fact that this proposal gives INEC the power to review elections results. If it is declared under the reason or in breach of the electoral laws and legal framework, imagine what happened in the previous elections when a returning officer says, I'm declaring elect this result under the rest, but this result were upheld by court. It would also reduce the way cases go to court because what would happen when returning officers either flout the laws or are forced to declare results, INEC would have a timeline to review these results and ensure that it is, re it is announced in line with the Electoral Act. And, and I think that is what is important, that is beyond direct and indirect primaries. There are other important provisions that this Electoral Bill proposes. So if the bill is not passed and we conduct the next election in this same manner, what is your biggest fear? Two major fears for me. First, citizens who don't have confidence in the process. Why? A lot of citizens, especially young Nigerians, have made a demand for a new law. If it doesn't pass, it passes the wrong message to Nigerians that our government, the president and national assembly, do not care about electoral process. So it would affect confidence in the process. The second, it would have a direct impact on the quality of elections because we have innovations that would promote credibility of the process and inspire confidence in the process and ensure that electoral fraud and malpractices are reduced. So right. those are two important points for me. Great. I'm coming to uh, yourself and Mr. Jabi just in a moment. Uh, Mr. Jake, you are one person that has fought and spoken up about the rights of uh, people living with disability. Um, are those care taken care of, or are those concerns taken care of in this uh, the, the new bill that is not yet passed? Thank you, Shengu. Let me start with a personal story. Uh, I never voted until I was 58, and today I'm 61. So you see, for 58 years, I've been disenfranchised, and that's because the provision in the previous Electoral Act says to INEC, INEC may reasonably accommodate us. This is one bill that have further given impetus to our agitation, which says INEC shall. It means a lot. I'm not a lawyer, but I know that it has legal implication. And that is why for us, getting this bill signed will give further hope to the likes of my colleagues who are here, David Agnelli, Grace, um, my friend Lois, and several others, Chris, many of them have left whatever they are doing and they are here in the hall to say to the president of our country that you have the only opportunity to write your name on a gold. This is one bill that will serve the need of persons with the disability community and give us hope that we too can participate in the electoral process. But not only that, that we too can be elected one day. I live and my dream is to see a person with disability become the president of this country, the vice president of this country, the senator, the governor, the house of rep. Who says we can? It's only opportunities like this and, and processes like this can say that we cannot. But we stand tonight to say, we can and we will. The nation apologizes to, to you and your friends for uh, the inability to, uh, to vote in our election. Shame we, we, take, we take the apology, but we want action. It will happen. It will happen. And that's the reason why we are here tonight. I'll, I'll get to your final take because what we are doing is we're warming the environment. The room is getting warm. And it's going to get to a point where this place is going to be heated. We have some of the brightest people that we can find in this country in this room tonight. And we are saying one thing, that the electoral bill needs to look, be looked into. For you tonight, what is critical? What do you think should be said tonight? The most critical thing is that that bill should become a law. The only issue of direct and indirect primaries is not the only action in that bill. There are several others. So it should be passed immediately. And one thing is that if laws are not passed and given enough time for internalization, it brings about implementation issues. 
which would of course affect the EMB, the Independent National Electoral Commission, in delivering on its mandate. Given electoral law, the legal framework for elections, few days, few months to election, is not an effective thing to do. So we should learn our lesson by taking action now and also guarding against delaying passage of electoral bill in the future. Thank Cynthia, you. you and your friends and colleagues, you've called us into this room today. It's early in the year. Uh, why are you not allowing us to go about our businesses and just focus on our, uh, on our work? And you've brought us early in this year. Your, what's your focus? What is your agenda? Well, our agenda is to ensure that our citizens will keep the demand on that we need the electoral bill passed into law now. And why we want it to be passed now is because we're barely, it's almost, the day is almost over, so barely 398 days to the elections. So we are running out of time. We need this bill passed. But beyond that, we also need the National Assembly to work with the executive to clean up the bill. We don't want excuses like we had in 2018. So whatever needs to be done, drafting-wise, should be concluded. And we need this bill transmitted to the president for assent again. And, and at the end of it all, Nigerians are watching. And the idea for this is elections is beyond just the process. It's about the people. And the people are those who determine what democracy ought to be like. And Nigerians are saying we need our electoral process to work for us so that we can take ownership of this process because Nigeria's democracy is for Nigeria, not democracy work, but it to the electoral process and we need this law, this bill passed into law. Today we go down in history as one day that uh, Nigerians uh, came together, uh, representative mm -hmm. of different tribes, ethnic, um, and every shape and uh, form of profession have come into this room, 16th of January. How will it be historical for you, Mr. Mr. Jake? Well, every year and every first month of the year, people come together to make resolutions. Today, we are coming together to make a resolution that, Mr. President, you have an opportunity to prove what you said when you took the oath of office. You said you are the president of the people. This is the time to put action to the words and the promise that you made. Remember, we elected you and we are asking you to do what the people want, not what the political class want. Shemu, we have made the resolution today that we are calling on the executive arm and the legislative arm to please make sure that the needful is done, and this first time inclusive bill is signed so that my people will indeed find hope in a process like this. This is one opportunity for everyone who is in this hall, who is watching tonight, to say to yourself that the day you were born, you cried. Everyone around you rejoiced. We must live our lives so well that the day we die, we will rejoice, and everyone around us will cry. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen and ladies. You know what? Uh, for those of us who grew up in the village, uh, when there is a village meeting and you gather at the city square or the town square, it's always in a circle like this, and uh, it's a replica of what you find there. Those who lived in the city may not have that kind of experience. It's historical <laughs> that some of us have gathered in this village meeting, which is representative of the meeting of the brightest mind in Nigeria. And tonight, we're going to make history, and you'll be happy, I promise you. Uh, we went to the street. And one thing that we are also asking, uh, the average Nigerian, a lot of people will wonder, do they understand what this means about this electoral bill? What do they really know about this? We want to know, and we captured their minds in this box box. I wouldn't want uh, uh, the National Assembly to override the president. Because the president has come up with reasons why he didn't agree with the director of primaries, which had been suggested. And uh, the, re the reasons are very, very cogent. So personally, I wouldn't want the, the National Assembly to override because they should think. Uh, if, they, if they think and they work together, it's better for everybody. As young people, I feel we should be given a, a space to also execute or tell people or showcase what we have as leaders. As a person, I take things very easy. Um, his reasons for not signing 
I may not know, but I feel if he does that, it will still be a, go a, a goal for Nigerians. How do we expect the National Assembly that is not independent to override the decision of Mr. President? Look, don't expect any miracle. They cannot. They can only come and tell us that they're going to override Mr. President. But I can put it to you that they will not override Mr. President. If you have a country whereby the National Assembly are independent, whereby their budget and everything is on its own, they don't go to him to seek for any help, then you expect that to happen. But with this kind of our country, Nigeria, you don't expect that. No, we need more digital input into the electoral process that will bring speed and accuracy and reduce the room for mismanagement and uh, what do we call that other word, magu magu. Shockingly, I agree with the president. He said, allow political parties choose. That's where free will, which is democracy, comes in. That he doesn't think it's right for a country to dictate to political parties. I think I agree with that. That's why we all have different ideologies and ways of doing things, so that we all can decide what suits us. In that light, I agree with the president. We know it will be very, very difficult for the crop of the National Assembly member that we have currently to muster that courage and actually override the president. But if you ask me as an individual, it will do not just APC, but the total, you know, totality of Nigerians, good. Let them override the president, not for the purpose of the president per se, but for the country at large. I believe direct primaries is the most appropriate because it gives every candidate an opportunity to, you know, to see whether, yes, you are, you are competent enough to be in this position. I personally will not vote for indirect because most times it is influenced by the cabals of the political parties. But direct primaries, if you are vibrant enough, you are qualified enough, everyone can now vote for you and say, yes, this is our candidate, this is the person we want to support. So I personally vouch for um, direct primaries. All right, thank you so much, everyone. We are getting started. The stage is set for my first set of panelists tonight. Uh, the governor of Nassau State, I mean, others that are going to be discussing uh, our first line of conversation is about the pillars of this electoral bill. Stay with us, everyone. We'll take a break, and when we come back, the conversation will commence effectively. I wouldn't want to... Uh How are you, sir? Happy New Year. Your Excellency. Yes, How are you? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, yeah, it's supposed to, <laughs> to unveil your face. Yeah. 
extremo. Thank you so much to the Citizens Town Hall on Electra B2021. The conversation has since started, though, but the fourth set of panelists on the program have joined me here on the stage. Let's uh, make welcome a former INEC chairman, Professor Ataya Rujega. Thank you so much, Prof, for coming on tonight. And we have Honorable Inena Ukeje, a former member of the House of Representatives. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Shane, for having me. And we have the Executive Governor of Nasarawa State, Governor Abdullah Isule. Thank you so much, Governor, for coming tonight. Thank you very much. We have the President of the Nigerian Bar Association, Mr. Ulumide Akwata. Thank you, President, for coming. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for having me. And the National Chairman of IPAC, Alaji Yabagi Sani. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. We have contributors for this very panel. Mr. Larry Arugundade, Executive Director, International Press Center. Mr. David Anyele, Executive Director, Center for Citizens with Disabilities. And Professor Remy Sonaya, former presidential candidate of COA Party. She will be joining us virtually. Let's get started. And I'd like to put Your Excellency on the hot seat uh, because um, some people will blame you and your colleagues for putting us at this very point, because they believe that it was the governors who opposed the bill, majorly uh, because of the conversation or the controversies around the issue of direct or not direct primaries, which one of the things that the president vehemently says, it is undemocratic and returned it to the National Assembly. What was the reason why you and your colleagues are not at home with that particular clause? Thank you very much, uh, John, for having me. And let me use the opportunity clarify the point. It's like you said, you know, putting me on the hot seat. Because uh, when you invited me, I said, how many governors are you inviting? I said, the only governor invited. I said, okay. And then, there we go, I get the first uh, question. You know, the idea is a total misunderstanding that the governors are against direct primaries. The governors are definitely not against direct primaries. As a matter of fact, going back to the year 2019, a lot of the states chose whether to do direct or indirect within the same political party. And a good example is, I will tell you, in the state of uh, uh, Niger, they actually conducted direct. And so many other states that we have under APC conducted direct. So it's not that the state governors are against direct. What the state governors say when we had a meeting that I can remember, you know, the governors clearly said, all right, if they box us into a no option, I'm happy Mr. President actually mentioned exactly what we said. You know, what the governor said is that why do we want to box ourselves, you know, into just an option? In case, God forbid, there is going to be another problem. There are so many states right now that even when you say direct or indirect, they can't, they can't, they can't have any. Zamfara, because of security situation we have right now. And so many other states, whether direct or indirect, because 
You see, direct is similar to what you will call general elections. So all we said was that, why don't you leave the options? And I'm happy a lot of the people who came out earlier mentioned that the electoral act has, is more than, you know, the bill is far more than just direct or indirect. There are so many important things there. Why are we boxing ourselves to either direct or indirect? So we say in our own party, the APC, if you look at our own constitution, our constitution actually says three options. The very first option is consensus. If consensus is not possible, you know, you can do indirect. If that one is not, you can do direct. So we say give the political parties the opportunity. By the time the opportunities are given, you will be shocked. In the 2023 elections, a lot of the states will still do direct. So why are you saying the governors are against direct, governors are against indirect? It is totally false. The governors are just saying that provide an option. Don't box ourselves into saying only one option. In case something comes up that that option is not possible, are we going to go back to the constitution or are we going to have some constitutional issues? So that's it. That's the front page explanation. But the inside of the book explanation or the politics of the intrigues around it was that some of the lawmakers were uh, somewhat uh, looking at the situation where the governors usually be the ones to determine who get a ticket for the House of Assembly, the National Assembly seats, and they said that they wanted to work. This is the backroom conversation I'm giving to you, Governor. Uh, and they said they wanted to work against that, that the governors are too autocratic in the politicking in their political parties and their state. And that's the reason why they wanted direct. They wanted the people to determine for themselves. You see, uh, Sean, sometimes once you have a meeting of the governors, before you even come out of the meeting, you will hear some headlines. And to be honest with you, most of the time, those headlines have nothing to do with the meetings that actually had taken place. But I think it's very unfortunate, especially the so and social media has become factual these days. The moment anybody just throws out something in the social media, it is assumed that that is it. I live very close to Abuja. In fact, just three hours from life here, I get here. I didn't even know there was a bill passed until the governors call and say that we were going to have a meeting. And when we came to that meeting of the APC governors, the subject was brought that there is the issue. What do we do? And I think the discussions were, why are they pushing us into, you know, just one option? Why are we not having options? You know, why are we not having things around and say this? We just finished our congresses in APC. The very first one that we had, there were no ESCO, there were no delegates. So we did direct. We just finished that right now. You know, so who says any governor is afraid of direct or indirect? I think that is a very, very wrong, and that's one of the reasons why I said, well, it's an opportunity for us to come and explain. You know, there are a lot of governors today who will prefer direct. Once you take the elections to their state, they want direct. Because they strongly believe they are more popular, you know, with their people than even with their party. There are some state governors that are not in good terms with even the, 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 the party leaders in the state. And those kind of governors will prefer direct. So uh, tickets are not usually a witch hunt tool against uh, opponent within the party because we've seen this happen. No, I think, I think that's just an assumption. You know, uh, uh, a lot of people... No, no, I've had people, uh, I mean, I've had conversations around it. So yeah. it's no longer an assumption. It is the fact. The lawmakers had come on my program to say, this is the situation of things. And they want a situation where the let, governors are no longer let, the ones determining things all by themselves. Let me give you an example with Nasarawa State. Because Nasarawa made a statement in 2011. In 2011, a party called the CPC came in with Muhammad Buhari wanting to be president. When it came, Nasarawa State, we didn't even know anything called CPC. And Muhammad Buhari had never won election in Nasarawa State during the ANPP days. But because there was arm twisting of the governor, the governor was in good terms with the party. And so Tanku Al Makura had no option going for you know, an indirect that was going to happen. So Tanku Al Makura opted with the people and now took over CPC and started trading. And the people told him, go ahead. 
And at the end of the day, Nasarawa State was the only CPC state in the entire federation. Not even Kasina State, the hometown of the president, voted CPC. We are the only CPC. Because the people decided that we want our governor, not uh, 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 the party, not delegates, no nobody. And at the end of the day, you know, the people now decided with the governor against what happened in PDP. So I think the question, that's why I tell you sometimes, is just perception and assumption that people believe that if the governor does this, this is that. If the governor does this, this is it. It's, it's just, you know, and most people are not actually politically involved. And as a result of that, they believe what they hear from the same politicians. You know, today, uh, today in Nasarawa, I don't, I don't really care whether direct, indirect, consensus, whichever one, let it come. Right. We're here. Uh, Honorable OKJ, uh, <laughs> have you been a victim of this situation? I mean, I'm very sure that you've heard the conversation. Uh, this is not the only part of it, but it was uh, the problem that did not, one of the problems that didn't allow the bill to sail through. Have you ever, be, ever been a victim of someone using ticket as a witch hunt? Um, well, um, Sharon, those are very, very um, strong words, using ticket as a witch hunt. <laughs> but what I will say is that um, the conversations around this, um, this clause in the bill, a lot of my colleagues have actually said that what they were trying to do was give more power to more people as against the direct, um, the indirect primaries which uh, was proposed. Now for them, and a lot of my colleagues speak to the high attrition rate, every political cycle, you find out that there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conversations about the tickets and there's a lot of uh, people start to pander to the leadership of the political parties because their, politi their, their tickets are imperiled by the perceived um, hijacking of the political structure systems and institutions by the governors. So yes, um, there is that impression by a lot of people. But let me say that, um, again, I do not believe that the lack of choice in the political parties, within the political parties, would actually engender better um, elections or better um, selection processes. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and I said to them that even if we were to have direct primaries, for instance, and people gathered together, this bill does not speak to one of the most important things, in my opinion, which is election violence. And if people came together and someone shot in the air, in and it was a group of people. People were, were going to run away, and then the same institutions that we're worried about would still hijack it and throw up the person that they require. So for me, I believe that it is conjecture in some places, but to some extent it is also real, that people constantly have to pander to the structured systems and institutions of, of democracy in order to get the political parties. And sometimes the people who are the bearers of the tickets do not necessarily re reflect um, the choice of um, the popular choice. So yes, sometimes it is taken over, yes. All right. I just wanted you to confirm to the governor that this exists. No, <laughs> I, I, I said that <laughs> conversations like this exist. Uh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> Prof, uh, but you spearheaded more than two election circuits somehow uh, in, in this country. And if you look at things, we wonder where, how, whether or not we can go into the next election circle with the present law that we have. What do you think is the effect, the major effect of the delay in signing this bill? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, and, um, uh, I, I think that this country will be better off if we go into the next election with a new electoral law uh, which would enhance the integrity of the preparations and conduct of elections. Um, the bill contains quite a lot of good things that can enhance the integrity of the electoral process. A good legal framework helps to have a good, a, a elections with integrity. And electoral integrities actually enhances democratic consolidation 
and the preparation and conduct of elections democratically. So, so really, since 2010, we have not had substantive improvements in the electoral legal framework until now. And uh, clearly, the bill contains quite a lot of substantive improvements. So we must do everything possible to ensure that we go into the next election with a new bill. But I think what is most important also is that we must ensure that this bill becomes law as soon as is possible in order not to hamstrung INEX preparations for the conduct of the 2023 election. So even the uh, governorship elections that would precede the 2023 elections. So it's very, very important that really uh, we have a new uh, legal framework for the preparations and conducts of the 2023 elections because it will improve the integrity of the preparations and conduct of elections. Now, on this issue of direct, indirect uh, uh, primaries, um, I think clearly the electoral process under normal circumstances would have better integrity if you do direct primaries appropriately. Because I think it's important to emphasize that because the discussions we've been having, people is very passionate discussion, people are taking position, and you are right. Members of the National Assembly perceive and some of them know for a fact that governors, maybe not in Nasarawa, but other governors manipulate the indirect primaries. And they think that if they move into direct primaries, they would be able to free themselves from that kind of manipulation. And they think that that will expand opportunities for citizens' participation. But we need to interrogate these things quite properly. You know, I, I would want to see a situation in Nigeria where we can have direct primaries and where we can do it well. As we speak now, Sheon, which of the major political parties has a clear register of members that they can use for direct primaries? Because if you are doing direct primaries, you need to have a register of people who have registered properly, who can come out, whom when INEC goes to monitor the elections, will know that the people who come out to vote are actually registered members of these political parties. You know, so we should be careful about trying to avoid or solve one problem and run into another problem. So to my mind, any governor that manipulates indirect primaries under the present conditions will also have the capacity to manipulate direct okay. primaries. Because the register of voters is not there and is key. To do direct primaries, you must ensure that every party has a register of voters that is credible, that citizens, organizations that are monitoring the elections can verify that the people who are coming out to vote are actually registered members of these parties. And the INEC itself that has a legal responsibility to monitor can ensure. So to my mind, really, uh, 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 until you do that, you will really just be moving without solving any problem. So my suggestion, what is key, what is a priority now, is give INEC the law to begin preparations for 2023 elections. And the only way to do it, the simplest way to do it, is not to override uh, 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 Mr. President, drop that issue of yeah. democratic prim uh, uh, direct primaries until you can ensure that parties really can actually do direct primaries when you want to do it. So that you can have a law that can be assented and quickly INEC will prepare for the 2023 general election. Let me tell you something that many Nigerians probably have not paid attention to. INEC made 36 specific recommendations to the National Assembly for the improvement of the legal framework, which would be better than the 2010 uh, Electoral uh, Act as amended. Out of this, the National Assembly adopted, without any correction, 25. And then it adopted five 
with some adjustments, so you can say partial adoption. So 31 out of the recommendations that INEC has made, which they believe was, will improve the credibility of the conduct of elections, are actually now contained in this uh, uh, bill. But the challenge is what the National Assembly itself had introduced. They introduced things, I will argue, sometimes perhaps without a, a, a real serious contemplation, thinking that it will solve a problem that some of them may have with some of the governors. <laughs> but it will not solve that problem. Mm -hmm. The challenge is how do you ensure that parties are properly organized, they have properly registered members, mm -hmm. and when it comes to election uh, of, of, of candidates for the parties to be fielded for elections, it, you use the proper register of voters. In fact, how do governors manipulate the uh, indirect primaries? It's through the uh, control of, of, the, of the delegate list. Because the delegate list is more or less like the register that you use for the indirect uh, uh, primaries. You know, so they will do the same thing and they will manipulate it. Mm. So what we need, we already have some fundamental elements that can improve the integrity of the elections. Mm. Let this be passed immediately. Re drop this issue of direct primaries. Think more seriously about it. It is good, it should be done. But if we proceed to do it the way we are trying to do it now, we are likely to create more problems than we will solve. Aladi right. Yabagisani, uh, for the political parties in IPAC, were you surprised when the president refused assent? Not at all, because uh, what baffles us is the fact that the National Assembly did not engage in what all legislative bodies do, which is consultation engagement with stakeholders before you pass a law. In this particular case, such an important bill was discussed, passed, without contacting the political parties to know how do we feel, how is it going to work. Okay. We are the ones to implement the law at the end of the day. Yeah. So for somebody who is altruistic, you, would have, you know, would have said, okay, let me ask even the managers people who are going to implement this law you know, after we are passed. So you blame the National Assembly? No, I blame them, and I think it's just a dummy sold to Nigerians for, for their own selfish interest, if, if truth must be told. Otherwise, this is not the first time we are trying direct primaries. We know it's a failure in all cases where it was, it was, uh, it was uh, tried. My party in particular, as we speak today, we are still in court because we tried in 2019 to introduce direct primaries in one of the states. Today, we are still in court, you know, with litigation that came out, which you cannot put your hands around, you know, the issues with themselves. So, I think, in National Assembly, I, I, these, are, these are people that are very familiar with these issues. So, for Mr. President to come out, I mean, and then this, again, is coming from the party that controls both the executive and the legislat legislative arm of the government. So, why should we have this conversation? That's why some people are suspect are suspecting the, the, even the discussions itself that is it not a red herring that probably the National Assembly is up to something that they have not told us or the executive is up to something they have not told us because if you remember, Sean, the issue of direct transmission of uh, results it was, was like uh, something that you know, Nigerians had to beg and then demonstrate in some cases that we need this direct uh, 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 transmission of uh, result electronically from the polling you know, uh, uh, points. So the point is this, why do they bring in something that has no relevance to the, to the, to the whole discussions? So the irreducible minimum is that the National Assembly must, because Nigerians say they want you know, the bill to be passed into law, I'm talking about the electoral bill which, is, which was sent to Mr. President, you know, minus the dummy that they put in it to, to <laughs> give us you know, some, uh, some conversation we're having today. It has no meaning, it has no relevance. Okay. I, I, you can't, you can't, I, may, I may accept, well, idealistic, if you, are, if you are idealizing, you can say do direct primaries because you can say, well, after all, democracy says, you know, government of the people by the people for the people. So it makes sense to say, okay, from the process, engage the people, but how? Which country is doing direct primary today? Not even America, that you can say have tried this thing over 200 years, 
they are still having problems with uh, even the system. It's delegate system. Go to every country that you can say, is it Asia, even African countries or Europe? Where is it practiced in the first instance? So why put us into these unnecessary discussions that have no meaning, no bearing with what we are talking about? What we are talking about is how do we improve the process of electionary in this country? And again, another issue that I think we should also address, like Madan here says, is violence, which most, in most cases are, are, are introduced by, 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 by the people that you know, have won. By the politicians. Uh, well, not, not politicians, by government, really. Because politicians are, do we have people who shoot in the air? Do we have the army? You know? No. But we so, hear so that the, some of uh, you politicians arm thugs yeah. during the elections. Well, I mean, you because arm, where do the, the arm am, am, ammunition come during the well, elections? Well, some politicians, and if you, if you track, if you trace their, their <laughs> origin, you'll find them in the politicians that I'm talking about. I won't mention any names here or any party here. But, but the point, and again, another issue that I don't know why is not you know, being discussed in this bill, in the law, is the issue of the obscene use of money yeah. during elections, before elections, during elections, after elections. Yeah. Why is that nobody has been tried in this country? You know, for, and, and everybody in the world knows that we, we use money to the extent that you, know, you think the whole thing is about uh, 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 what you go to a Dumata market to buy. You have to carry money in, 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 uh, in Ghana must go. Cash and carry. Cash and carry. Cash of, and you know, carry politics. Exactly, politics. So I don't know why we did not, you know, in this bill, address that issue, how to, you know, ensure that the agencies, you have EFCC, you have CPC, I mean ICPC, you have all sorts of uh, agencies. Why is it that no one person, you know, has been taken in front of the court to say, you use money? And we know that the money is used obscenely to distort you know, the, the people's mandate. So, so I think for us... But I, I guess with electronic transmission of results, even when you have the money, uh, I think one of the agitation is that if these laws are passed, even when you have the money, the money will fail. No, it won't no, fail. No. This, this situation the will, money will, will still work? It will work. More than <laughs> much more than before, because it's like garbage in, garbage out. What we're saying, we're not talking about electronic voting. We're talking about electronic, electronic transmission, transmission of, of, of all the... Uh, all because the reason why I said so is that we saw election in Undo, we saw it in Edo, where, and, I mean, a lot of people will say that uh, there, were, there was a seemingly likeness of what happened at a polling unit and the outcome of the election. So uh, people were saying money is already failing some politicians. Well, or, 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 or you oppose that? Or, <laughs> I, the point I'm making is that what we are talking about is transmission of results. Yeah. The question is, you know, politicians, like you said, you know, very smart, you know, who find a way, you know, with time, how to, to, to even make it more uh, completely, you know, out of tune with what people really did at the poll, at the, at the, uh, at the polling, polling, polling uh, booths. Yes, you know, in terms of how people are, are circumvented by way of inducing them with money, you know. So, so but I think if we have to be serious and we must be serious as a country because this country is too big you know to be toyed with in terms of all the things that we have as a people you know uh, somebody here mentioned that the other countries look up to us for leadership and and if we go on like this you know diverting attention from the real things and then giving us things that everybody knows has no meaning with what we are talking about i mean please you know we must be all right uh, let me bring in this yeah let me bring in the president of uh, the nba this is basically about the law and uh, the nba i would say is like the conscience of the judiciary system in this country um are you worried about how things have panned out since the president declined assent and these conversations have gone on uh, uh the the legal window that we have left for us what is your biggest concern should these not sell through? Thank you, Shimu. Am, am I worried? Uh, I'm petrified. I'm, 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 I'm so disappointed the way things are, have panned out. Everything about that bill, or at least most of it, spells progress. Most of the provisions in the bill, to my mind, are pro-people, pro-the-people. 
I see those provisions as incremental steps being taken to correct the process that has been adjudged by all to be deficient. We cannot, we cannot get it right all at once. You know, and so you can forgive people for thinking for a second that our government is anti-people. You can forgive them if they come to that conclusion. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Leadership on, at the executive arm, leadership at the, uh, in the legislature. We have a bill that has, as we have heard today, so many innovations that would advance the course of this nation and her people, including ensuring that INEC gets funding one year before the elections, including that people living with disability are included in the process, including that uh, you must submit the names of your nominees 180 days. These are, all, these are all provisions that are responding to issues that have been highlighted in the process that are in need of fixing. And then the president has that been on his table for quite a bit. And then last minute, almost last minute, because as we have heard today, we are running out of time. You can't foist a new law on a process and expect that process to work. There must be time. As uh, Professor Jagger has said, you can't, hamst you, can't hamst you can't allow for the process to be hamstrung by a new legislation or a new piece of legislation. So Mr. President has pointed out this issue of uh, direct or indirect primaries and has decided that on the basis of that, he is sending it back to the National Assembly. I think, as uh, the speaker before me has mentioned, that we can be forgiven when we conclude that all of this is a smokescreen of some sort, and that um, there is that, what we have is a spanner being thrown in the works to keep us in, in, uh, in the doldrums, so that we'll stay with the present uh, uh, dispensation because this is something that could easily have been fixed. Mr. President is of the same party as those who control the National Assembly. This is something that could have been fixed. I don't want to go into the legalese. This is something, if really our leaders are interested in progress for the people and for the nation and are not, uh, are not, uh, are not uh, fixated on uh, political uh, issues or issues that have to do with their own political fortunes. This issue should have been fixed. This bill, everything about it spells progress for the Nigerian state. Now, if, if there's a problem with direct and indirect primaries, I agree totally with Professor Jagger that we probably need to think carefully about implementing that uh, particular aspect uh, because we may not be ready. But I think this is some, these are housekeeping issues that could have been sorted out by those who are uh, in the, uh, at the helm of affairs in, in both arms of government. For us to get to this point where we are almost, uh, January of 2022 is almost over, and we're still talking about this, and Shay, you ask me if I'm worried? My God, I am, I am, I am so, so saddened by it because everything tells me that this is not gonna work. Everything tells me yeah. that the booby trap that has been set is actually going to capture all of us, and then we'll be back to square zero. And then we're going to go into another set of elections. And I think it was one of the speakers before us who said that we'll do the same thing, expecting uh, different results. So, so we are in a bit of a pickle. We have, we have a problem before us, and uh, our leaders need to really give this thing a rethink. There is a small window, a uh, small opportunity. I think the issue of direct and indirect primary, since the president has thrown a challenge, in his interview with you, has, uh, has said to us that if that provision is removed, uh, the, he will sign, he will assent to the bill. I recommend to the members of the National Assembly, uh, let, us, let us take him at his word, take out those, that provision. You, you understand? We can deal with that further down the road. Like I said, these are incremental steps. Take out those provisions. There's too much in that bill for the baby and the bath water to be thrown away. Hmm.
I, I'd like to get some views uh, outside of his uh, circle, I mean, and the, uh, and the outer circle. I'd like to bring in Larry Arogundade, the Executive Director of International Press Center, just in about a minute or so, if you can, Wayne, con uh, bring in your contribution now. Uh, Mr. La Mr. Arogundade. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shion. Uh, I'm here. Well, I, I, I think uh, you started this conversation by talking about uh, the question of time. You know, time is central to the discourse that we're having. And in looking at this, uh, the, the blame uh, goes both ways. Uh, first is the fact that uh, it took quite a long time uh, for the president to get back to the National Assembly about his objections to aspects of this uh, important uh, bill. It took almost a month we grant the right of the president to make consultations with different segments of the society, but that should also have been done with the understanding that we need to have this law so that we can at least uh, comply with frameworks that govern elections in our environment. Uh, you know, the ECOWAS protocol on elections, the African Charter on Democracy and Governance, all talk about the fact that anything about electoral law should be concluded a year to the elections. So I think that uh, the, the executive has part of the blame. But now that it has gone back uh, to the National Assembly, I do agree with everybody that uh, we need to do the needful. Otherwise, you know, it would just be like that, you know, old songs that says, uh, how many times shall the head turn for the eyes to see? Uh, how many times shall we pass bills for us to have uh, credible elections in this country? And now that we have an electoral act amendment bill, that in, in a substantial sense captures the aspirations of the people at the National Assembly should do the needful. But let me also uh, send this warning here that it's not only on the question of dropping the red primaries or not dropping it, that the president might not assent to this bill. And part of the concern from those of us from the civil society, uh, especially the EUSDJ partners, is that there are so many fundamental cross-referencing errors in the bill, which in itself speaks volumes about the seriousness by which our legislators you know, take the issue of uh, lawmaking in this country. Uh, we all talk about the whole question of uh, you know, how well they are well, how well they are paid, their allowances, and the rest of them. And one would expect that at this stage, they should be able to pass a bill where you know, these errors will not constitute obstacles. Uh, Cynthia mentioned this in uh, the earlier part of the conversation that in 2018, August 2018, the president declared assent to that bill because of those errors. And we are worried that if those errors are not corrected, it might be a reason for the president not to assent to the bill. And some of them are quite important. Uh, there is a clause there, for example, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, 14.2, that talks about election petition amendments. And in that particular bill, that particular clause, they are relying on a non-existent provision, talking about section 134 of the Electoral, of the electoral Act Amendment Bill, which does not exist, whereas what they had in mind is section 285 of the Constitution. There is a clause where you just have mere repetition, clauses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, were essentially repeating the same things. So we have a precedent where the president did it assent to an electoral bill because of those, you know, errors. All right. So the National Assembly, so when this bill goes, but so why we're now concerned about time is the fact that, well, consensus dropped the red primaries, but they also have to take care of all this, look at it very carefully, so that by the time it gets back to the president, uh, the needful uh, will be done. All there right. are many institutions in this country, Sheon, outside the political organizations that have oversight functions in elections. The media, my constituency, for example, Section 22 says we should monitor governance and hold government accountable to the people. We need to hold the political parties accountable to the electoral law. We need to hold INEC itself accountable. And if we do not have a credible law, it would actually undermine the capacity of the media to right. set a proper agenda yeah. for our so, electoral process. Yeah. Thank you. Let me bring in uh, Professor Remy Sonaya. She's joining us virtually a former presidential candidate of Kowa Party. Let me take your uh, contribution, uh, Prof, quickly. Former presidential candidate of Kowa Party. Thank, 
Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Um, th thank you. I am quite concerned about um, the deficit of trust that seems to be evident in some of the expressions that we have heard on this program this evening. We have heard words being used by, you know, people um, on, on the platform who are really concerned. Words like red herring, like, you know, booby trap, smoke screen, uh, spanner in the works. I think that we are at a, a very, very uh, critical moment in terms of Oh yeah, um, just a moment when we're enjoying uh, our contribution. Uh, let me bring in uh, Mr. David Anyael, the director, Center for. It's the fact that uh, we, we seem to be having problem with the connection. All right, I guess we. Okay, if we can hear, uh, uh, Prof. I, I cannot hear you. Okay, go ahead. There was uh, some kind of distortion in your connection earlier. But I should go you, ahead. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. What, what I uh, am trying to say is, is that we should probably look beyond the letter at this point and look at the spirit of the conduct of the elections themselves. The various uh, stakeholders, uh, it, it seems as if, you know, the people do do not think that there is a real interest in improving the integrity of elections in Nigeria. And I think that I would like, you know, to um, join in this call for asking that the direct primaries issue be removed. Okay, is that the problem? Let us remove it and let us see whether the president will go ahead and actually uh, uh, assent to this uh, bill so that it becomes law. And let that be done quickly, because as it has been repeated, there is a lot more to this bill than direct primaries. And it is, we are doing ourselves a huge disservice if we uh, focus entirely on the direct primaries and forget all the other benefits, like uh, the, the NBA presi uh, president has outlined them. Uh, so I would very much like us to think in terms of, of the spirit. Is there a real desire to ensure that we have credible elections right. in Nigeria? Let me bring it in, it uh, seems yeah. as if, like I said, there's a deficit of trust. People are not really sure that uh, the executive and the legislature are really interested in doing this. So they have to prove that they are. All right. They have to prove Thank that they so are. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, uh, let me bring and in that Mr. is what David we're looking Anyale, for at this time. Uh, the executive director, Center for Citizens with Disabilities, for his own contribution. It's supposed to be a minute to two minute contribution. Please, you can go ahead, Mr. Anyale. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I've been, you know, paying key attention to the conversations. And one of the key issues that, you know, interest me in this new draft bill or the bill is the issue of overvoting. Uh, clause 51 provides that, you know, uh, where there is overvoting vis-a-vis -vis number of uh, uh, voters that were accredited, that, you know, that's what will be used to calculate the winner of such elections. If such uh, provisions is adhered to, what that means is that issues around trust, issues around acceptance, issues that leads to uh, 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 struggle for uh, winning uh, or the winning of elections will clearly minimize. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is a time people with disabilities in Nigeria are clamoring for the passage of this bill, it is now. The reason is simple. Throughout the Tatsi State of the Federation, an average person with disability is committed not just to vote, 
but also to participate as a candidate. It is only when we have a credible, uh, generally accepted electoral framework that ensures that their confidence and trust in the electoral process is guaranteed that we trigger them to participate. Most of the things that we are all asking for, especially the marginalized populations, are all bordered around governance. About three years ago, 17th of January, 2019, President Muhammad Buhari signed into an, into an act, the Discrimination Against Persons person with Disabilities Provision Act. That act is in line with some of the provisions that the Lutheran Act has provided. Therefore, we are asking that Mr. President should do us a favor, as he did on the 17th of January, 2019, by signing this bill when the National Assembly returned it back to them so as to guarantee Nigerians that Nigeria belongs to them, that their views count, that Nigeria, the future, is possible all right. for all of us. Thank, Thank you so you much. Uh, let me bring uh, the conversation back to the stage. Um, I know, uh, Governor, I know you have an appointment just in a few minutes. Um, the, uh, you, you are very close to power. Uh, I'm talking about power at the center, meaning that your party uh, owes sway at the center. And a lot of conversation have gone around what your party that has the control uh, and the executive and in the legislature can do. It does look to me tonight that this is not a minority argument. It is a popularity. Uh, it has a popularity amongst the Nigerian population. And what do you think your party should be considering? This is a large clamor, loud clamor from Nigerians. Are you listening to it? Are you going to yield to it? Uh, of course, I'm listening to it, Aishewun, and that's why I'm here, and I'm happy that I, I came and listened to all these um, uh, highly respected individuals, you know, who have been participants, have been part of it. You know, it's different from where you are seeing it from outside than when you are right in it. Because, like, if you listen to Professor Jega, you know, he even mentioned to you why direct primaries will be impossible now. You know, he brought about the, the register. Even though our party, our professor, just finished our, our registration uh, exercise, with the exception of maybe two states or so, you know, which we have done. And then earlier on, you know, our party, when it was registered, we had like 100 people pay every uh, award, you know, that were registered. So anyway, that is, that is a, a, a side. But you see, and then I also listened to uh, our leader of IPAC, you know, where he mentioned challenging people to even go back and see which country is actually doing what we are trying to do, you know, just because some governors are untwisting uh, some people at, 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 at this. And I listen to everybody, including the MBA uh, president as well as my sister, you know, and it looks like everybody is saying, if the issue is just about direct or indirect, why are we getting ourselves there? And that was the only subject the governors had, you know. So I'm going back again to the governors, the one you mentioned. The governors are very happy with whatever contributions that have been made. A lot of contributions were made by INEC into this bill. A lot of contributions by, are made by several other organizations. I've seen Raf Sanjani also here, you know, with the contributions that they have made. IPAC made, you know, and everybody. At the end of the day, those who collected those contributions and put it into a bill and sent it to the president remain politicians. You know, because sometimes our people are saying that why politicians are anti-people? Why it's the same politicians that put it together at the National Assembly and send it to Mr. President and say, this is what the people want. And Mr. President, now from what I heard when you were actually interviewing him, he said, I have no problem whatsoever. Like uh, the president of uh, 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 MBA said, I have no problem with all the good things that are in this particular bill. No problem whatsoever. They are for the people. They are this. The only one I have a problem with is this. And it looks, everybody is saying, if that is the only problem, set it aside. I think this town hall meeting is over. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody is saying the same thing that the governor said from the beginning. Just set it aside, and, you know. And, and you know why a lot of people are worried also? Yeah. It's because the president has promised also that it will leave a legacy of good election. That's one of the promises. You think it will keep to it. And this is one president that can do that. I have absolutely no doubt in it because you mentioned about I'm a governor and I'm close to that. I, I wouldn't tell you that I'm one of the closest people to Mr. President, but the time I have sat with this president, I have seen the genuine frankness in the way he talks and what he says. 
You know, I can't say Mr. President is perfect. I can't say Mr. President has everybody around him, the best of people. I can't say that. But as a person, and what he says, this is one person that he will tell you, this is what I want to do, and he will do it. This, I believe, right. about uh, Mr. President. So, I mean, you've been in the National Assembly. Yes. Uh, usually when we have this kind of thing, go back to the National Assembly. How easy? Because somewhat, it's, a, it's an ego issue. And we've seen this with the arms of government. So when the executive had returned this bill to the National Assembly, what kind of reaction do we, should we be expecting? Um, I think that um, the major job of members of the National Assembly is to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the Nigerian people. As we have sat down here, His Excellency has just said it, that you know, there's almost a unanimous clamor for this bill to be passed. This evening has highlighted so many other things that a lot of people probably were not aware of. So the National Assembly is duty bound to listen to the clamor of the Nigerian people. Our egos boost probably, but I even listened to um, the Speaker of the House, um, Speaker Agbaja Amila, and he said that um, at some commissioning some days ago, that if that was the only problem, that he was going to take you back to the National Assembly. Now, from the way he sounded, you can see that his back, I mean, he's not building walls around himself. But let me make the point that every National Assembly wants to leave a legacy. Every executive wants to leave a legacy. And I believe that straight out of the Democrats' um, book, playbook, is to leave a legacy. And if this is the one bill, polarizing bill, that has brought Nigerians together clamoring for the one thing. And in their oversight, it's also a constitutional requirement that you oversight laws, appropriations, and policies. Now, if the National Assembly in its oversight has seen that there's certain lacuna in the previous electoral act that have made Nigerians suspicious of the electoral processes, that the National Assembly will, as a matter of urgency, do what it has to do. Because already as it is, like I said earlier on, it is the job of the National Assembly to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the Nigerian people and do it. The National Assembly must project that which the Nigerian people want. In this room, we have everybody. We have civil societies. We have the NLC. We have the clergy. We have everybody saying the same thing. And all we're saying is that the Nigerian electoral processes have not delivered on the kind of elections that Nigerians want. Already as it is in Nigeria, and you know, we have seen that um, liberal democracy is imperiled around the world. We've seen that even in the United States that is the bastion of democracy, we have actually seen them hold um, a summit where they're having conversations about democracy. Nigeria as well plays that role in the sub-region. Every time there's a problem on an infraction in democracy, Nigeria is called to be front, right, and center in having those conversations and driving those conversations. So the National Assembly owes it. It is the, it is the right thing to do. It is the patriotic thing to do. And it helps Nigeria continue to maintain her position as a leader in the sub-region. Because right. if we don't do that which we must do, then can you imagine Nigeria selling to other countries the beauty of a democracy that we do not have? Right. Therefore, I believe that the National Assembly will do what they must do, which is carry the voices of the Nigerian people in, of the utmost importance and at the shortest possible time go through that, not only expunging that, but also looking at the inelegance in the drafting that makes it an embarrassing piece of legislation. I think that the National Assembly will do that in right. the shortest possible time. Um, well, we'll run, uh, run up this uh, session. I have one or two um, questions from the floor. Uh, it's a town hall meeting, so it's supposed to be uh, an all-encompassing conversation. Uh, Obina and Adara, please stand by. But uh, before we get them ready, uh, Prof, uh, you've uh, organized elections in Nigeria. How difficult is it for, from what you're saying now, you're watching from the outside now, uh, the job of the man who succeeded you, how difficult do you think it is because of this old drama? Well, um, conducting elections in a country like Nigeria is certainly not an easy thing. It's a very difficult thing, but it's doable. And uh, I think both the chairman and the electoral commission and the other commissioners themselves can be helped a lot with a good legal framework. 
because everything is supposed to be done in accordance with the law. And uh, as I have said earlier on, since 2010, we have not had substantive, remarkable improvements in the electoral legal framework. Now we seem to be on that trajectory. But again, we are wasting time. So you mentioned issue of ego. I, I think the National Assembly should not be thinking about ego. This is about the nation and improving the integrity of elections in our country. To my mind, when they resume, in a matter of maximum 10 days, they can address all these issues that have been mentioned now, whether the issue of cross-referencing and editing, as well as simply dropping the issue of uh, direct uh, 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 um, primaries. You know, we are not saying drop it because it is not good or because we do not accept that there are problems with the way in which indirect primaries are currently conducted. But we are saying that, look, you cannot throw the baby with the bathwater, you know. Don't go ahead and say out of ego, as you said, that we must have it, and therefore we are overriding Mr. President, because there are legitimate concerns and problems if you go ahead to implement it. Yeah. You know, so drop it. Let's think more carefully, prepare adequately uh, in future. But these good things that are already in this bill, should be signed into law immediately so that INEC can now begin to prepare guidelines and the issue uh, what needs to be done mm -hmm. so that they can start serious work with the 2023 general elections. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Your, uh, Your Excellency, I, I would like to excuse you because I know that you made a commitment that you're going to be here, albeit you had uh, a prior engagement. But I must sincerely thank you for coming. Please, can we put our hands together for the Executive Governor of Nasrallah State. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, let me quickly uh, get the, um, the question in from uh, Obina and Adaura, and I'll get the reaction from uh, the stage here. Obina, uh, they're contributing from uh, the floor. Obina and Adaura, quickly. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Obino Sesiogu, um, Executive Director of Advocacy for Civic Engagement Center. Um, well, Nigerians do not trust the electoral process, um, and that is the fact. And this is backed up by evidence when you look at the trajectory of voter turnout since 2003. It's been on a steady decline. 2015 it was 43%, um, 2019 it was 34%. And um, due to the work that we do at an organization, uh, we're in the streets. We interact with the people. We're trying to get them registered to vote. And they continue to express their distrust of the process. And one thing is clear. There's a general consensus among a lot of Nigerians that the electoral um, bill, you know, is, is, is timely. And it is clear to everybody that it will go a long way to show up the confidence of um, Nigerians. One of the common denominators in the conversation that we've had here today is that one, um, direct and indirect primaries, it's, um, it's something that can be stepped down for the moment. Um, and then the second consensus that we have here, we seem to have here today, is the sense of urgency. And the fact that all hands need to be on deck to ensure that this bill is passed. And my question will go um, to the distinguished speakers here today. Um, First of all, of course, to the MBA president, because he represents my constituency as a lawyer. And of course, to the um, legislator as well here. What specific things can you um, commit to do based on the resources you have, the influence that you have um, as the head of the Nigerian Bar Association and um, the former legislator who, of course, has a relationship in the House of Representatives? What specific things can, or commitment can you make here today that um, you can do to, you know, apply pressure on right. the House of Representatives right. to pass the electoral bill. Thank you, Obina. Let me, let's make the uh, interventions very quick and sharp. Uh, Adara Nyokwe, uh, please, uh, you have the floor. All right, my name is Adara Nyokwe. I'm a broadcast journalist and also the head for Women, Affairs and Gender for African Union Cluster Committee, Nigeria. Um, I, I once came across an article that said interrogating the Obanji Abiku spirit of the Electoral Amendment Bill. And um, when I read it, it was very emphatic and very directly 
speaking to the issues. You're talking about a document that has five times been sent back to the sender. And now we're looking at the timeliness of this bill. I want to ask, amongst other things, um, this is very important to me because first, as a Nigerian woman, I'm also looking at the cost of election, money politics in election, which is what section 88 of the bill also looked at. And in the new version of the spending limit proposed in the section, it now seems to say that candidates seeking presidential election are allowed to increase their cash hold from 1 billion to 15 billion. Those who are looking at governorship are allowed to increase it from 1 billion to 5 billion. Senate 1.5 billion from 40 million. House of Rep now can take that from 30 million to 500 million and state assembly from 10 million to 50 million. Now, if we're looking at inclusion of young people in election, and the voices of women's participation. How critical is it to also look at ending money politics in this conversation? And I put this because I know that Honorable Nenu Keje is sitting down there and she also represents the voice of women. Is it important to also look at this as a problem and begin to also take that detail and take it back to the National Assembly? Thank you. Thank you so much, Adara. Thank you for those interventions. And uh, I think it's a, it's a good point for us. Let me allow, I'd like to have a view, Sani. Uh, to intervene. Uh, money politics and uh, of course I'll allow uh, the NDA president and Honorable Kege to respond to those interventions yeah. also. Yeah, thank you, Shemu. I think but one thing here. Uh, I, I wouldn't like ourselves to play to the uh, suspected you know, scheme whether it's true or not by you know, trying to take a fine comb through the whole thing and say this, uh, you know, must dot this I and cross this T and all these things, you know. And then again, we get ourselves bogged down with such details. I think, you know, the act of legislation, like uh, we all know, is, is not a destination, it's, it's a journey. You know, we can, I, I remember the PIA bill, that is the Petroleum Industry Act, was passed with, with some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, uh, areas that are not really, you know, engaged, you know, the way it should be. But in spite of that, the bill was passed. And today, you have agencies that have been created based on the, on the passage of that bill, and amendments immediately, I think within the 24 hours or so, you know, the authority again was preparing an amendment, you know, to those bills. So I would like us to be careful not to, you know, uh, get ourselves into another problem where the National Assembly will say, oh, uh, because we have to do this, we have to do that, this, you know, we are highlighting these things. So we must be careful not to get ourselves entangled in some of these fine details that we're talking about. I'm not saying it's not, they are not important, but as a nation, you know, we can go on. I mean, it's not as bad as where we're coming from. Anyway, what do we have today? You know, and, uh, and uh, so that's one thing, you know, caution I want to, uh, you know, sound, a word of caution. Then money politics, like I said earlier, you know, is something that we must address and address it in a manner that will allow you know, the mass, the critical mass of Nigerians, especially the youth, to get involved in, 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 in party politics. We, the, the political parties, we, we are preaching to the Nigerians that we want youth, we want human, women to come in. Then if we now say that you must have this amount of money you know, before you come in, uh, I, I don't think that's what the bill says. The bill says that you can spend as much as that amount of money. You know, it doesn't say that you must pay. You know, one, I mean, uh, how much billions? We're talking about the, the, the limit. Is yes, it the not limit. obscene to it's, have that kind of money? It is, but what I, the, po the point I'm making is that we shouldn't box ourselves into mm. a situation where we now play the hands of uh, those, like some if of us are saying today. we are people who do not really have the money, yes. and we are, uh, we are given a spending limit, yes. it's like you don't have money, and you're giving yourself a terrible, uh, uh, an obscene, a budget or limit, spending limits, is, is, it not, is it right? Is it morally right? It's not right. That's but the question. The, the point I'm making is that it doesn't say you must have that amount of money before you can participate. But should we extend that limit? That's, it, we shouldn't. That's the question. We shouldn't. But don't, it shouldn't be an issue here now. Let's go on, please. Mm. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, let me bring the NBA president. What, what, what are your thoughts? On what? On money, first, I mean, money, money, the money, Money politics one, uh, the spending limit, but again, the question of where we, uh, we need to go from here is asking for, um, uh, the Obina, Obina the, yes, yeah, yes, asking for how your intervention will help the process. Yeah, I wanted to address uh, Obina's, uh, Obina's uh, direct question to me first, which is uh, what, as MBA president, what, what I will do. So on, on the, 
You know, let me backtrack and say I agree with uh, His Excellency the Governor now, now who has now left us, that this meeting is actually over, right? And, uh, and uh, I think we have, we've narrowed down the issues. And on the 22nd of December, I issued a statement where, amongst other things, I mentioned that the ball is right now in the court of the National Assembly. And the options open to them are actually two. Um, take out the, deal with the, uh, the direct primary issue and represent the bill to Mr. President, or take the historic step and, uh, and uh, override his veto. So what would we as the MBA do? Uh, I think we're fortunate to have uh, amongst our membership quite a number of members of the National Assembly, quite a number of them are lawyers. I think uh, beyond the statements that we have issued, beyond uh, appearing in, uh, in events like this and uh, articulating the points, it behooves on us to go to those members of the National Assembly and let them understand that history beckons, right? We, ha we are at a point where we will need to do that which is most important for our country, even if personally we suffer, even if egos are bruised, even if uh, we don't quite agree. And so that is the step, the very practical step that I intend to take on behalf of the NBA, to go to the lawyers in the National Assembly and to make sure that they take, make, and we don't have time. So that much we will need to do right now. And, uh, and if I may just uh, quickly refer to the point that uh, Professor Shunaya raised, which is the issue of uh, trust deficit. It, it is there. Uh, Obina mentioned that there's, there's no, the, the people don't trust the process, and, the, and there's, a, there's a huge trust deficit. Our leaders in the executive and in the legislature should not increase the deficit. They should do more to get the people to trust. Otherwise, conspiracy theories will continue to abound, and we will be continue to second guess their motives as to why we are having this conversation, as you have said previously, that is actually needless, you know? So we, we must, we are, we are at this point now, if all it would take is to get rid of a direct, no, not get rid of it, step it down, as Obina rightly said, direct primary issue, so let's move on quickly. And so in terms of practical so, so, steps, that's what, what I would So the, the, the official position of the NBA is what you have told us now? The official position of the NBA, speaking through the president, is that we will go to the National Assembly and encourage particularly our members to do the right thing. I have said it before here and I repeat it. If it will take stepping down direct, the issue of direct primaries, do it. And go to Mr. President, go back with, to, to, with the, the bill. And I am very much in support of those who have mentioned the, about, talked about the inelegance of the drafting. I think it's a bit disappointing. So it's an opportunity for our, our legislature, our representatives to deal with that. We present the bill and we can deal with the issue of direct primaries further down the road. Right. That is the position. We need to wrap up uh, this uh, panel now. I I'd like to uh, get your final thoughts uh, quickly on some of the interventions made. Um, okay. Um, she uh, had spoken about their Biku going back and forth on the bills and also about um, the fee bill, the money politics. But let me make the point that um, I think the figures are obscene, that in the same way that a lot of um, consideration has been made for people living with disability, in Nigeria, poverty wears a woman's face. And so we can't, on the one hand, encourage women to come into politics, into the political space and make it more inclusive and then have limits or even bottom um, levels that are way outside of the financial reach of the Nigerian woman. I think that um, those, those, that clause does not really take into consideration, into cognizance, the fact that the Nigerian woman is a minority in Nigeria economically, and she's economically disempowered, especially in post-COVID. Now, um, as far as I'm concerned as well, I believe that um, the backing and forthing of the bill, the, this is a bill that has been re denied accent four times. But let me make the point, and I want to give the president the benefit of the doubt, that this is the first time that categorically the president has spoken twice. One at the Democratic Summit with the United States president, where he said that he was going to leave um, 
Legacy. Legacy one, and that he was also going to leave frameworks that were going to deepen and strengthen democracy. Second of all, he said it to you, Shane, that if that was removed, that if that contentious clause was removed from the bill, that he would assent. He didn't say, I may assent. He said, I will assent. And he has also said, I do not want to fail. I don't want to be a failure. I also believe that the first page in a Democrat's book is to live democracy better than mm -hmm. you met it. So I believe that if we take all this into account, I believe that Mr. President will has um, the responsibility to himself, to his legacy, and to Nigerians to append to that bill because he had said that he will. All right, I've been told that we have just about 30 or 40 seconds uh, left on this panel. I'll, I'll give uh, Prof well, that, that opportunity to. Um, uh, frankly, I, I'm glad that the issue has been raised about this extending of the spending limit. And uh, I, I, I think that we were so concerned and debating and putting pressure on the issue of electronic transmission of results and the other issues that we tended to not pay attention to that issue. But it's a very, very important yes. issue. You know, how, where is a presidential candidate going yes. to get 15 billion yeah. naira to run? Billion. Yes. yes. Or a governor to get 5 billion or a, a senator, you know? So, so uh, if unless you are a Dangote or an Ote dollar, where you can use your own money, you know. So what they are doing, what they are doing is they are turning our democracy into plutocracy. You know, government of the rich, for the rich, and by the rich. So, so it's a very, very serious problem. So all these contradictions, which uh, our sister here has pointed out, really, it's it. On the one hand, you say you are including women and people with disability. On the other hand, you are saying you have to have a lot of money to be able to contest for a particular uh, office. You know, it's a terrible contradiction. And uh, frankly, if people are serious, we've been talking a lot about reducing the influence of money in politics. But what they are doing through legislation is to actually make it more difficult for those who do not have money to be able to contest for office. So left to me, this may be another thing that within the next 10 days they should be able to really curtail. What does it take? <laughs> yes. No, I must, I must yes. sincerely so, well, thank this part. This sort of really. part, yeah, um, so, Professor yeah, Atai Rujaga, a former INEC chairman, thank you so much. It's good to see you again, Prof. Thank you. Honorable Inena Ukeje, former House of Representatives member, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you very much, Shil, for having me. And you. our very good president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Mr. Olumide Akwata, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Shil. Uh, Alaji Yabaji Sani, the national chairman of IPAC, thank you so much, uh, Alaji, for coming. Thank you, Shil. Uh, no. Also, Larry Arugundade, David Anyele, and Professor Remy Sonaya, all of those who contributed in this uh, panel. We have quite an interesting uh, conversation there. But we'll take a break. We're not done yet. We're looking at what should the National Assembly members do. From tomorrow, they will be planning to dot their chairs and their tables and desks after they've gone on a long recess to come back to work. Nigerians are expecting them to return to work. And when they return to work, there is only one thing that they're asking of them. And that is a conversation we'll be having next on this platform. Stay with us, everyone, because up next, we'll be hearing from some lawmakers in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. We'll also have some opinion molders will be joining me right on stage, and the conversation will be even more robust when we return. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. Thank you. Guys, I'm I am absolutely sure both the President and the National Assembly will do whatever is right uh, for the nation. I don't think the controversy between the uh, President assenting to the bill and the uh, National Assembly, you know, digging in and say, I am absolutely sure both of them interest in mind. 
and definitely. Top ten provision of election funds to INEC Clause three. The bill strengthens the financial independence of the Independent National Electoral Commission INEC by ensuring that all funding required for a general election is released not later than one year before the next general elections. Inclusion of persons with disability, Clause 54. The Commission shall take reasonable steps to ensure that persons with disabilities, special needs and vulnerable persons are assisted at the polling place by the provision of suitable means of communication. Legalizing electronic accreditation of voters, Clause 47. The bill makes provision for electronic accreditation of voters using smart card readers or any technological device as may be determined by INEC. Redefined over voting. Clause 51. Redefined over voting. Clause 51. According to the bill, over voting occurs when the number of votes cast at an election in any polling unit exceed the total number of accredited voters in that polling unit. With this new provision, total number of accredited voters will become a determining factor in the validity of votes in an election. The outdated definition had been exploited by politicians to manipulate electoral outcomes. Substitution of candidates in the event of death in an election. Clause 34. The new bill addresses a lacuna in the current electoral law which was manifest in the 2015 governorship election in Kogi State, where a candidate died before the result of that election was announced. The bill affords political parties the opportunity to conduct primary elections to replace a candidate who dies after the commencement of polls and before the announcement of final results and declaration of a winner. Par to review election results declared under duress. The bill confers INEC with the power to review declarations and returns made under questionable circumstances to keep returning off. Penalty for contravention, Clause 8. A person who, being a member of a political party, misrepresents himself by not disclosing his membership, affiliation, or connection to any political party in order to secure an appointment with a commission in any capacity, commits an offense and is liable on conviction to a fine of 5 million naira or imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or both. Electronic transmission of results, Clause 50. The bill confers INEC with the powers to determine whether election results...
We seal on the Citizens Town Hall on Electoral Bill 2021. We have a round, new round of panelists and we begin the conversation in Annas. This set of conversations will center around legislative and executive action required to conclude the process. Let's get straight to it, everyone. I have joining me the spokesperson of the Nigerian Senate, Senator Basiru Ajibola, who is virtually joining us from the United States. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Basiru, uh, for joining us. And also we have uh, Honorable Ben Kalu, the spokesperson of the House of Representatives, is also joining us virtually. Right on this uh, platform, I have the president of the Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Ali Uwaba, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Shewin. It's Ayuba Waba. Ali Ayuba Waba, apologies for that. <laughs> and I have Mr. Izenwa Nwagu, the chairman, partners for electoral reforms. Thank you for coming. Also, the president of uh, the, uh, the NUJ, Mr. Chris Izuguzo. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. And uh, Honorable Dachong uh, Bagos, a member of the House of Representatives, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Sharon. We have the convener of the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room, Ms. Anna Obi. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I don't know if um, our panelists on the virtual platform are here with us. It will actually be good for us to begin the conversation with them. Uh, but if not, I think we have a member of the... Okay, let me begin first and foremost with uh, the sp spokesperson of the Senate, Senator Basiru Ajibala. Senator, uh, the ball is now in your court. Uh, that is what everyone tonight has said, as much as their contributions that we've heard. Um, a few people are disappointed. Now that the ball is in your court, how do you feel as a senator, or as a lawmaker, when you're hearing Nigerians speak in this manner over this very, very sensitive piece of legislation. Hello. Please go ahead. I said, uh, this, uh, this, uh, look, this is the program from the beginning. I don't think there's even unanimity about position that have been taken. But what is clear is that Nigerians want reform of the electoral process. They want a um, credibility of um, the election, and they want a um, timely closure to the issue of the Electoral Amendment Act. Uh, beyond that, I've also had uh, some uh, people coming up with a uh, conspiracy theory of uh, an attempt. Uh, to frustrate electoral reform in Nigeria. I think a uh, part of uh, the thing we have to contend with in the uh, public governance is uh, issues like such conspiracy uh, theory. But I know there's no such a conspiracy not to allow the electoral bill to be passed. Indeed, the Ninth State Assembly have expended I mean, resources in terms of time and uh, uh, man are on this uh, work that we will not I mean, allow it to be frustrated. And then, of course, when you have 185 section bill or so, and the issues is only around the section, then the thing is to look at what are the options uh, before the National Assembly. Uh, one option that uh, septic may be thinking is that the National Assembly, this next assembly will go the way of the previous assembly by abandoning I mean, the work. But just as the uh, speaker of the House of Assembly said, right on the book by Dabi Amila, we are not going to throw away the baby with the bathwater. There are so many significant provisions in the Electoral Act that seek to strengthen, even though on incremental basis, the institution of free and credible election in Nigeria. So therefore, uh, the options will be considered is not to abandon the Electoral Bill, uh, like uh, previous sessions of the National Assembly, but to look at two, I mean, options, and I think uh, Professor Atari Dega and some other speakers, I mean, like uh, uh, the uh, MBA I mean, uh, president, has also highlighted. One is to see whether the uh, contentious, I mean, provision could be amended so that the bill could be represented, represented to the I mean, president. And of course, 
uh, this uh, will be after broad consultation that have been agreed upon by the National Assembly. Then the second one is uh, to see whether provision of uh, Section 58, Subsection 5 of the Constitution can be invoked to override I mean, the veto. But of course, there is a uh, decision of the committee that that will necessitate passage of the bill by two third majority and the legislative processes also being going. That's also an option. And this option has to do with ego, has to do with taking I mean, historical I mean, attack on any institution. We are concerned about ensuring timely passage of the electoral bill. And I think the list, the one with the least uh, requirement in terms of time, timely requirement would ultimately I mean, be adopted, but that would depend on consultation with the National Assembly. Then I must also say that it is not true uh, what has been said here by the chairman of IPAC that uh, stakeholders were not engaged. It's quite unfortunate, I mean, for somebody to make that assertion here. Yeah? If there's any bill that has involved engagement of stakeholders, not only political parties, civil society organizations, and members of the public, is the electoral I mean, bill amendment. I personally had attended I mean, several I mean, fora organized by civil society organizations. So somebody to come here and say that civil society organizations or political parties were not consulted, I think that I mean, could not be correct. And then on the issue of uh, issue of cross-referencing, there are matters that are dealt with at the level of the secretariat of the relevant committee. And I think uh, this has also been looked at. And of course, whatever decision is taken on either to amend the contentious provision on direct primary or to seek to override veto, the clean bill that will be sent to the uh, to the president will address I mean, these challenges. But I will say that uh, the issue of uh, a provision on the uh, money uh, for campaign is not, nobody is saying, National Assembly is not saying, if you want to be president, you must have 10 billion or you must have 1 billion. It's only giving a cap to which you can uh, spend money to such that you cannot uh, extend that uh, cap. The truth is that the logistic of conducting a presidential election in Nigeria is so huge. You have 774 local governments and more than 200,000 uh, uh, polling units. You also have I mean, what? You are going to have personnel, you are going to have I mean, logistics and deployment in this regard. So it's not a case of people whimsically just setting a threshold for the purpose of saying that if you want to contest, you must get it. It may well be that those people you want to engage in uh, logistics, in deployment of uh, a campaign, will be volunteers and they will not require money. But what the bill is saying is that the threshold that you must not, I mean, uh, extend right. beyond is that sort of money. So it's not I'll, the question I'll, of monetization I'll come back to you of our in a moment, uh, Senator. Uh, let me. I'd like you to tell us tonight, in just a sentence, what is the official position of the Senate based on the uh, uh, the communication from the presidency? Of he can't day. ask me to say, thinking of one hundred and nine senators and 360 legislators in the House of Rep in one sentence. And what I will say is that when we resume, we will subject the letter that have been sent by the president to us to a debate and look at appropriate I mean, response to it. And you could see that Mr. President sent a 19 paragraph letter seeking to convince us to reconsider our decision. Knowing by a senator of Mr. President, I've been somebody who is usually, I am mean, very reserved and possibly laconic in his expression for him, to take the liberty of going, I mean, at length to seek to convince us. I think those is argument, rationalizations will be considered. And of course, we are also getting feedback uh, from uh, Nigerians uh, in the uh, civil society organizations in our constituency. But what I can assure you is that the new electoral act, together with the uh, very fundamental reform aiming at uh, uh, ensuring credible election, will, I mean, be allowed to see the light of the day, the, right. the light of the day by the next assembly. Going by what I requested, uh, a sentence, that is a complex, compound, complex uh, sentence, uh, <laughs> but it's allowed. Uh, uh, hearing from the, uh, the spokesperson of the Senate, since we have the spokesperson of the House, let me also hear from you, um, Honorable uh, Benjamin Kalu. And this is the question I'd like to pose to you tonight. Uh, from some of the conversation had tonight, in fact, someone has said outside of this room today, that it does look like some kind of disorganization, considering that it is the ruling APC that controls the executive. It is the ruling APC that controls the National Assembly. 
how on earth, uh, how on earth will you find a situation where you cannot come together on a simple legislation? Uh, and the question the person was asking me to ask you is, is, that your, is your party so disorganized that it cannot agree on one thing? Thank you very much, Xiaowen, um, the organizers of this program. Uh, let me just point this out that there is no disorganization. Uh, it's a process of lawmaking. And uh, because of the independence of uh, each arm of government and the application of uh, the principle or the doctrine of separation of powers, each of the arms of government under the leadership of APC is allowed to exercise in its fullness their rights, their enablement to function in that arm of government. This is what we're allowing the executive to do, and that is what the executive is allowing us to do. And it is important to note that what has influenced the National Assembly in going for this electoral reform is not ego, like so many people have pointed out. It's not the beauty of have, generating a rancor or agreement between the executive and the legislature. It is influenced by are being a signatory to various instruments, the legal framework. You're talking about the Article 6 of the um, ECOWAS Protocol on Democracy and uh, Good Governance. You're look at, looking at Article 17 of the African Union uh, Charter on Democracy, Elections and Good Governance, and also the ultimate Article 21 of the UN um, Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, what runs through all these instruments is... Uh, that at all, at all time, as a participating nation among the Committee of Nations, that we ensure that a free, fair, inclusive, and credible election is conducted in our country. Because uh, the commitment of the Ninth Assembly is to ensure that uh, you know, this electoral reform um, is achieved. And based on that, we started you know, tracing the nexus between credible election and political stability in the country credible election, the bond between credible election and economic prosperity, and the linkage between credible election and uh, you know, uh, uh, healthy uh, social space. And on the basis of this, we now went on this voyage. It's not to satisfy our ego. It's to make sure we give Nigerians that which they have been yearning for. And we picked up a few focal points, which you know, it's a guideline to the various clauses that we've been discussing. It runs through the various guidelines of the various clauses we've been discussing. One is the inclusiveness element. The second one is the transparency element, the accountability element, and the competitiveness element. These are the four key focal points that the National Assembly of the Ninth Assembly has focused on. And you will see it running through the uh, clause 52, clause 87, everybody's talking about clause 43, sub 1, 2, and you see it running through all the other issues that have been raised here, like the persons with disability and all the rest of them. But now, as it is, the consensus of the people, which we represent as parliament, has been presented to Mr. President. And don't get it wrong, Mr. President acted within the conformity of section 80, uh, uh, 58, 4, which allows him to withdraw his asset. And Nigerians should know that Mr. President you know, is a Democrat because there's no expectation in that particular uh, section 58, uh, sub four of the constitution for him to even issue explanations. But he went ahead to give us long paragraphs of the reasons why he feels they should be constitutional. The reasons he has, been, he has yeah, canvassed. I, I, I'd like to follow up quickly on that. Um, you've given us, uh, it does look like yeah. you did a very good homework in trying to attend to some of these issues. Uh, and our question tonight is, someone said tonight that uh, this town hall was over uh, like an hour ago because people have now passed the ball to your court and wanting to know what the National Assembly will do when you resume on Tuesday. Can you give us the official position of the House of Representatives on this matter? 
uh, as a spokesperson of the House of Representatives, it will be difficult to, like my uh, colleague said from the Senate, to summarize the opinion of 360 people and just push it out there. But the point remains that there is a constitutional provision as allowed by Section 58, Sub 5. Whether we are going to activate it or not, based on the letter that the President has said, is what we will consider. Another one is to go the route of leaving this particular one aspect of the entire clauses of this particular piece of bill, which is uh, clause 87. And going ahead with other ingredients that pursues the agenda of the Ninth Assembly with regards to electoral reforms. Are we going to, because of one clause, jettison the other benefits of this particular piece of legislation? Uh, are we going to involve ourselves, like so many described, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in a, an ego trip where we say it's either our way or nothing? The answer is no. The people's opinion, the people's views, the, what interests the people, what will advance the democracy is our concern. And that is what we are going to do. I give you my word. And okay. that becomes, okay, so that word is from the body language of the parliament. Okay, so great. Now, once we you resume. Got to the point, the, uh, and, and of course you know, that you're not uh, only speaking to people in this room, you're speaking to the entire nation because you're live on national television. So you have, uh, we're going to hold yeah. you to your word. What the Nigerian people want, uh, at least the majority of them who have spoken to some of their representatives here in this room, is that they want the National Assembly members to revisit it so that they can send it back to the president. Are you saying we should hold you by a word that you will do just that on Tuesday? We will. But just in a moment, let me uh, get some other panelists to, uh, to get into the conversation uh, so that we will not hear the solidarity song from the NLC. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Waba, uh, what is next? from your own point of view? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sheun. First is that uh, it's very loud and clear that time is of essence. Uh, because uh, we ought not to be where we are about the issue of this very important bill. And let me start the conversation uh, from where actually we even arrive at where we are. Uh, first is that it was President Yaradwa that agreed that the election that brought him was actually flown. And you remember he actually went ahead to constitute the Justice Waste Committee that made a lot of uh, recommendations, some of which are well celebrated and some of which have actually improved the integrity of our election. But down the line, we also realize that there are new challenges that have arose. There were pronouncements of the courts that have said that some of the uh, 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 provisions that uh, INEC have implemented, that uh, some of those pro pronouncements are not backed by law. And uh, those pronouncements of court are very, very important, particularly uh, the issue of uh, electronic accreditation, uh, which has been called to question, and the issue of uh, the uh, uh, card readers. All of us know that those pronouncements are very profound. And therefore, with time also, I think INEC as an umpire have seen that there are a lot of deficits that need to be improved. And put all of this together, uh, there is now this agitation for a new act. And I think everything has been done. A lot of resources, a lot of time spent. But here we are. It's unexplainable. And I think there is no justifiable reason why we have not been able to get this law uh, to date. Uh, but I think uh, everything is not lost. Uh, but importantly is that time is of essence. And uh, I expect now, going forward, that there must be timeline. Uh, because there is no way, even the authorities that have been cited, including the AU and the African Charter, he said one year before the election, everything must be certain. Now there is uncertainty because the law is not in place. Even INEC as the empire, is there, there are a lot of uncertainty. So what uncertainty? And how do we get this thing certain is by having the law in place. So what can be done is for the National Assembly now to do two things. But I think obviously from the conversation here, one thing is actually very important. One, one to align the law and make it also coherent. But secondly, is also to remove that portion that is a bit uh, controversial that have led to Mr. President not assenting to it. But in doing that, we must have timeline. If not, we'll actually working behind time. Uh, I think that's our position, and I think we can also uh, assist in the deployment of uh, what you said, Aluta, by lobbying and also by also trying to get our National Assembly members to do the needful, because uh, for us this is central. There is a nexus between good governance and leadership that will also be accountable to the people. If the electoral process is transparent, is credible, it will bring about good leaders. And therefore, they must also do the yearning and aspiration of Nigerians. If politicians realize that one man, one vote will count, 
one woman, one vote will count. And if there is dispute, the card reader or the electronic aggregation in every polling station can say that 10 people voted instead of the bogus we go we are cutting. I think we are going to get it right. There will be accountability and the system will work better. At I what, assure you of that. At what point will you mobilize your, your members to the well, street? <laughs> basically, this is, a, talk about this, this is a town hall meeting. <laughs> we know that as a matter of fact, before this January ends, we expect that the needful should be done. And I want to assure you that Nigerian workers are ready. We are a membership-based organization. 12 million members registered. They answer their father's name. They can actually push a process. So I want to assure you that the timeline is between now and the end of the seventh. We should be able to have something ready. You know the address of the National Assembly. Certainly. We there are, are about customers. Two gates uh, to the National Assembly. You've been there. Have been we there. are customers you, to the National you're, Assembly. You're, you're and I can say there. that uh, they know that uh, we care so much here. about this issue. Yes. <laughs> We they know be, that we, we, we care so much about this issue. Yes, we care so much about this issue. And therefore, they know that Nigerians are very passionate about having certainty about election and also certainty about how we can be able to connect. Because government is government for the people, by the people. So allow the people actually to realize what they need to do to have credible leaders in place. This is what we expect. Let me bring someone who had, uh, over the last 20 years or more, uh, monitored Nigerian elections. Were you surprised, Mr. Nwango, when the president did not accept? Okay, I ask this question because I've had this conversation with you on TV and outside of the, uh, the, the studio, and we've had conversation on how far-reaching this bill will be for our elections. But now that is not assented to, how do you feel? Well, so I'm not particularly um worried in the sense in which I see quite a lot of people, you know, discuss the withdrawal of assent. Because I am one of the people who believe that there is some elite conspiracy around not giving Nigeria a law that can inspire electoral integrity. And I can tell you the reason why I feel so. The the, the legislative treadmill runs in a way that there is some infusion of executive processes in it. The Attorney General of the Federation, Minister of Justice, ordinarily should look into this whole you know, process while it was being hatched through the different backdoor processes that are open to them. So the eyes ordinarily should have been crossed and the T, I mean, the T's crossed and the I's dotted before we got to this impasse that we, 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 we got to. Who advises the president on legal matters? Who is the final person? Uh, I thought it would be the attorney general. And I do know that that happened through this process. So if you have cross-referencing issues, backtrack to 2018, backtrack to a National Assembly, that has constituency project laws, bills that have Kenyan shillings, you will then understand that most of the time, politicians, whether the president or those in the National Assembly, like to create emergency. So when they create emergency, they leave the electoral management body in a situation in which it can use discretion. And what discretion is around, corruption is very near. So the big issue that you have is that until we collectively hold our politicians responsible for not giving us electro the elect electoral law that can guarantee integrity, what we have done is a binary conversation about a deal good National Assembly and a president who is refusing to give assent. But if you collectively take it and shake it together, you will see that we are under politicians who have decided to subvert electoral integrity. And one way to go forward is to name and shame all of them collectively and ask them to do what is right for the Nigerian people. And we should mobilize all that needs to be mobilized to make sure that that happens. Otherwise, uh, we, are, we are expecting the president to be nice, you know, he will sign it because he said so. Is he a priest? 
Is he not a politician? If he doesn't sign, what will happen? The pressure needs to come on the National Assembly to do what they have to do and ensure that they have a clean law that is going to the president. Because if eventually you take it there, the president understands all the articles that you are referencing, all those articles, article, AU article, and all. he understands it. So he keeps pushing you to the point where you get to six months, whether you like it or not, Nigerians will say, we already have something, let's use it and make it law, and then we get back to where we've always been. Thank you so much, Mr. Anwano. <laughs> let, me, let me come to the president of the NUJ. Uh, for you and some of our colleagues, uh, section 22 of the Constitution clearly, I'm not sure uh, there is any profession that, are, that is clearly stated in our constitution, but the media profession, clearly stated. Not even the legal profession is stated in the constitution. This is probably the most noble profession that I know, the journalism profession, the media profession. Now, um, it comes to the point that this is a law in which uh, the, the constitution asks us to hold the politicians and the government accountable to the people and report back to the people. From your own point of view, what are your thoughts? What comes to your mind? Thank you very much. You know, looking at this whole thing, uh, first of all, one must uh, uh, observe the fact that uh, who are the direct beneficiaries of a flawed electoral system? The politicians. And who are we asking, who are we reposing our confidence in at this critical point in time? Same politicians. We must have it at the back of our mind that if we want to have a deepened democratic process, a deepened system, it must be completely rooted in the people. We must have an electoral system that works because the sum total of the conversation that we're having today is to have an electoral act that guarantees one man one vote. And by the time these votes are cast, they are properly counted, collated, counted, and announced. That's exactly what we're looking at here. Now, I recall there was a time when the National Assembly also got to this kind of situation that we are in now, where we had an interesting amendment process. Because of one controversy, one contentious issue, that revolved around third term. The entire process was thrown away. Today, we have another contentious issue that has to do with direct and indirect primaries. Beyond that, if you look deeply, you would also see the issue that has to do with announcing results under duress. You and I are not the beneficiaries of that particular clause, you know? Now it's in the system. We are dealing with direct and indirect uh, 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 clause, but there is that one that they benefit from. Beyond this, they are going to still look at it. So that's why it is important that this kind of meeting is taking place. Let them come to that reality that Nigerians are ready. They ought to be ready too. What will I'm happy. Your, what will you be telling your members tonight? The journalists well, across the nation. You made reference to section 22. Actually, chapter 2 of that section has to do, it reposed the responsibility of holding govern, government accountable to the people. Now, I want to also use the opportunity to appeal to our people because oftentimes you see a group of people that operate within mercantile considerations, operate within pecuniary interests. We must put the nation in the front burner. No matter what we do today, we have only one country we can call our own. If we have an electoral system that works, it works for us. If we have democracy that is deepened, it is for us. So we must have that at the back of our mind. No matter what happens, we are like barracks. The soldier comes, the soldier goes, the barrack remains. So we must bear in mind that if this country works, it works for all of us. But if we begin to report or carry out our reportage based on our own tainted pecuniary or mercantile interest. When the country collab collapses, it collapses on our heads. Because the question will be, the media sets the agenda. And sometimes politicians want to distract the nation from the real issue. The real issue as of now 
is this matter? Would you be telling your members the same? Of course, of course. I recall when we were talking about restru restructuring, we brought it at the front burner. It became a mantra for every politician that is contesting even a councillorship position who say, I will uh, restructure the country. Because it became the topical issue. So I want to also appeal to our colleagues, including you, every one of us across Nigeria, the topical issue now is to have an electoral law that works for us. I want to appeal to National Assembly members. It's not about telling us that, yes, we are going to make it, we are going to deliver it, but we want action, All right. not just words. Some so, of us will not sleep until we have it. Thank you. That's a promise from me personally. That's good. <laughs> we'll play our role. That's what the Constitution asks us to do, isn't it? Uh, Honorable, I, I, I might be asking you a, a very uncomfortable question because the conversation is also uncomfortable, mm -hmm. uh, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Cross-referencing errors. Mm -hmm. Is it not embarrassing to see those kind of basic things in law, such as drafting? Not one, not two, not three. Over 10 cross-referencing errors, drafting errors, from a law that was passed from the National Assembly to the president. And if anyone blames the president for not assenting, would you blame him for assenting errors legislation filled with errors. How do you feel? Very uncomfortable, Sherry. Um, even before your question, uh, with the civil society here, I'm already uncomfortable because a lot of them are hammering politicians. And AZ never knew that I was with him before, getting as a polit before becoming a politician. But very uncomfortable in the sense that, uh, you see, most of the things that have been done in the National Assembly uh, involves consultants, especially at the committee level. And as members, we usually have a session on the floor, consideration of bills. And during consideration of bills, we look at most of these areas critically on the floor. And after looking at those areas critically on the floor, it's now been sent to the consultants to do the final drafting. And after the final drafting, it does not come back to us to the floor. We expect that most of the things that we have made such corrections, it's what is being taken out. And at the end of the day, you find out that uh, because consultants or other, uh, maybe the clerk's office are doing a rush work or so on and so forth, at the point, most like I, I, can, I can pinpoint one of the cross-reference that on the floor, we made that correction. But what was submitted was the same thing that we corrected. Honorable, were those consultants paid? Oh, uh, well, absolutely. You know how much Nigeria uses in servicing the National Assembly? Uh, well, you are being like, paid every month. Like, honorable. like, like, like so like, was your colleagues. No, sorry, oh, just a moment. The question uh, begs, I mean, because here are Nigerian people face to face with their elected. Uh, 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 members uh, in the National Assembly. Nigerians don't, ha Nigeria doesn't have money, and we use that same um, uh, insufficient money and to let, service let the National Assembly. So, just a moment, I wanted to put my question through. The question is that consultants are paid mm -hmm. for error legislation. Let, let, let me tell you, the consultants. Do you think that the, the, the explanation is tenable to Nigeria? Most of, like, like on the electoral bill and processes, some of these consultants are even paid by grants and donor agencies, not even from the National Assembly. But in this as is the law for Nigeria, so, honorable. But it's but very the, embarrassing. The, the law is, has the name of the National Assembly. Absolutely. But like I said, very embarrassing. Let's in the sense this that is a private, what we corrected on the floor is a different thing. Would you pay people for a bad job? It's a bad job that was done. And I believe that such issues will be brought for discussion Do when we come Do you think that Nigerians deserve an apology for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, Nigerians deserve an apology because uh, uh, we are being taken there for thorough jobs. Each and every one of us have five aides, and most of our aides, in terms of legislative aides, senior legislative aides, and most of them are lawyers, and we did this. So at the end of the day, what you now find out outside is different from what we're... Definitely, we will take responsibilities. 
in as much as it came from us. Nobody will now say, well, it was because of the, uh, because of the consultants or so on and so forth. Yes, I'm giving the background at which how it became so. But we will surely take responsibility. We, we, we heard, and that's why I allowed you to explain. Yeah. But I'm actually passing some of the questions from people to you, the way they feel that Nigerians don't have money. A lot of them cannot feed themselves. But we, I, I guess that is a first line charge for the monies, the allowance of the national assembly members. If a shoddy job, Nigerians need to ask questions. And that's why Absolutely. I said it's an uncomfortable question. And I gave you a premise to it yeah, before yeah. I started asking you. Absolutely. And Nigerians are disappointed. We are We're paying for a shoddy job. We apologize. Let me come to you, um, Mr. Anodi. You are the convener of Situation Room. Uh, you house a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, an, an organization that has a lot of civil society organizations. Um, what do you expect going forward? Today is Sunday. Tomorrow is Monday. All eyes are going to be on the National Assembly, isn't it? What are your expectations? Thank you very much, uh, Sheung. You know, sitting and hearing about these errors, it makes your heart beat. It makes us know that we are being taken for granted for so long. It shows you, you know, there is a lot that the government is doing because the government is government. We are not government. There is a lot that needs to be done. There is a lot that is not being done. And, you know, when you are talking, of, we are going back to the house now. It would have been easy to say, okay, the Ninth Assembly, do they have the capacity to veto the president? They have it in the law. But when you come down to in terms of can they veto the president, that's another. But the president took 30 days, 30 days saying nothing to the end of the year. In 2018, three, more than three times, the president turned down this particular bill. And at the end of the day, said it was too late to the time. And now we have been dealt with. So when you have 30 days, and you said nothing to the, uh, uh, to the assembly, within the 30 days, Nigerians are asking for law. The, um, the, 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 the uh, Twitter has just been unbanned. But many Nigerians were on, on Twitter. Whether you ban or unban, they were there. But what we are saying, we are patriotic Nigerians. We are calling for law, you know, we, we, the issue of lawlessness. We call for respect for the rule of law. That's why we are asking for the law. The Constitution already has granted the, uh, um, that's the INEC, the body that is responsible to organize and conduct elections. How they conduct, that's another area we need to look at. But we are now saying, the president is saying, bring this, I will sign it. It was beautiful to see him say that. But why did he, no explanation to Nigerians about the 30 days that just went by. Too late. But going forward, what are they going to do? Like the president, you know, the uh, uh, NRC president has said, we are watching them, we are just watching them. But they need to know that we are tired. And it is essential to see when Nigerians are asking you to do something, it means they still respect you. There are some bad people that are, you know, conducting our governance, but there are also some good people. We just don't want to pour away that. But the president has not been fed to this country. If there are errors in it within the 30 days, why did he not return it? We cannot, now the president went ahead and signed the petroleum bill you know, they, they, yeah, and, and assented to the petroleum bill to make it an act. It had problems and they turned it immediately. Why is it bill? Imagine the energy that went into this electoral bill. And we are still here and we are talking, we are watching them. You say you want to leave a legacy. A legacy for one law. The, the lawmakers, the lawmakers ought to also look at the fact that we are taxpayers. They are paid by our tax. I'm a taxpayer. Everybody on this, on this table, we are paying taxes. Transparency and accountability is very important. The issues of corruption, what this law is look at, looking at is, is going to tame a lot of things about corruption in elections. You were in, a, in Anambra, you saw what happened. It's going to become more important for you to look at the issues, to fight corruption in elections very freely. 
and who does not want. So leadership about Nigeria, we are, while we are sorting this out, there are lots of issues that are going on. All right. Lots of issues on, on violence against women and girls that is going on, on insecurity that are going on. Many girls are being kidnapped. The Chibok girls are still in the bush. There are so many girls that are, be, are in the bush. So there is a lot that is going on. All right. Why do we have to go through pain for this to happen? All right. So let me bring uh, some contributors into the conversation. Dr. Akin, Akin Bolu and Mr. Hawal Ramsajani. Both of them will be giving us their interventions in just about um, uh, 60 seconds or 120 seconds. Mr. Should I begin with Dr. Akin Akin Bolu? Dr. Akin Bolu. Okay. Uh, all right. Doc, thank you. Thank you, Shion, for. All right. Thank you for giving me the floor. Very uh, interesting conversation, very, very timely. Uh, and I think that um, these panelists have spoken very, very, very well. Uh, my own intervention is going to be very, very short. Um, it is along the lines that um, the recommendations you know, that have been placed on the table tonight uh, that time is of essence. Uh, this is a process, you know, that we can still, what's the word, savage, that we can still get to a conclusion uh, in a way that uh, will still be acceptable to us. Uh, the National Assembly resumes in less than 48 hours, about 36 hours. And I think that uh, what has started tonight, you know, should continue. Uh, I'm from civil society, and I know you know that civil society will not be tired, and uh, engagement will move very rapidly. Uh, and that is by way of putting um, uh, in place different kinds of activities, press conferences, uh, discussions with uh, members of the uh, National Assembly, different kinds of initiatives. Uh, the media, we already heard, you know, from our president, uh, the president of the NUJ, uh, what uh, could happen. We've heard, you know, from the uh, president of the NLC, the kinds of things that are possible, you know, to make sure, you know, that this happens fast. Uh, I join those who suggest that, yes, uh, heaven should not fall if we step down, if we allow uh, or support the National Assembly to uh, step down this contentious clause and do the needful on the remaining part of uh, the bill. Uh, I support that. And I think that um, what should happen is that on Tuesday, as they get back into, their, uh, into the chambers of the National Assembly, the deliberation should take place quickly. Right. Within two weeks, we should have something back to the president, and by the close of January, All right. I hope that uh, Mr. President uh, would have uh, kept his promise. Right. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. Akimbolu. Yeah. Let me uh, allow uh, Mr. Ramsajani quickly your intervention on, on the way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not in any way surprised that we are having this cogmere because the government in the first place had no intention to ensure electoral transparency in Nigeria. This is because for seven years, the president who said that he was a victim of electoral fraud, he has not initiated any bill to improve electoral transparency in Nigeria. <laughs> Number two, National Assembly members should not use this opportunity to spend another resources, money-wise, in the name of going to do consultation over this. There's nothing to consult. These issues have been you know, identified that are the problems based on the president rejection. All we expected National Assembly is, as soon as they come back, they should embark on cleaning up this document. Civil society have helped them, and that's why when you attack civil society, it means that you do not know the value of what civil society are doing. Civil society group identify those legislative errors or drafting errors. 
which the National Assembly members, their consultants that they pay huge amount of money, did not do. Which means that civil society is actually contributing to democracy, to good governance in Nigeria. We do it free of charge. We submitted it to them. So we've already done the work for them. All, when they come back, they did not waste money to go and do any so-called consultation that will spend billions of Nigerian taxpayers' money. They should, as a matter of fact, if we have a serious concern over this, I expect the National Assembly to suspend whatever holiday they are doing. Because already, based on even the agreed or the constitutional requirement of their sitting, they did not even sit up to the time. So I expected when the president returned this, they should have even called back, called the holiday back to come and do this thing because we all need it as a nation that will aspire to help lead other countries. All right. Thank you so much, yeah, Mr. Ramsey. Uh, I have uh, a question from uh, architect uh, Ezekiel in your air talk. Uh, if you can quickly pose your question, allow the lawmakers to respond because it does look like uh, they're the one that needs to answer questions. Uh, okay. Architect in your air talk, quickly. Thank you for this um, privilege and opportunity. Actually, it's a contribution, not um, a question. And that is that what is going on, Nigerians need to know. It is a very, very conscious, deliberate action being taken. And I want to say that the National Assembly, the Presidency, and the Governors are in the same vehicle. And this is a war between them and the people. We've come to a point where <coughs> Mr. President has made a categorical statement. If you expunge this aspect, I will sign. And tonight in this hall, where every section of Nigeria is represented, and this is about Nigeria, and we have said, please expunge it. We are willing to lose this for today. Nigerians must have our eyes on the ball. We don't want any more conversations. We don't want any more discussions. We have agreed as Nigerians to lose that part and to fight another day. Please expunge it. The civil society has gone ahead to do all the cross-referencing. Everything has been done and will be submitted to them on Tuesday. Take that. It doesn't take you more than one or two days to go through what they have done. And you had over two weeks staying at home. You were not just relaxing. You have been looking at it. So within two, three, four days maximum, you have a clean copy, send it to Mr. President, and let us see how Mr. President, Mr. Integrity, will not keep to his words, and sign that, and all that's right. all we want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Architect Vinyaka. Let me allow the two spokespersons of uh, the two chambers of the National Assembly uh, to come in here. Now, uh, the ball is in your court. What promise can you give us? First and foremost, people will be asking the question, uh, how long will it take before you are able to deal with it procedurally? Um, will it have to go through any of the readings again or it gets to the floor and you are able to fix it and pass it? Some say that it won't take more than one day. Are we seeing a situation where on Tuesday you get back to the National Assembly, <laughs> you do the job until evening time, on Wednesday you are sending it back to the President. Can it be, be that quick? Because time is of the essence. Let me begin with Honorable Basiru Ajibala. Senator. Uh, Senator, sorry. Senator Ajibala Basiru. So I think it's uh, very important to set uh, that in context. I will say that uh, one, the, I, I, I find interesting some of the conversation here are taking issue of a legislation to be like a pedestrian and a work. Issue of legislation is a very informing work that uh, you cannot expect me to give you one word answer in that regard. I want to say that it's also not correct that National Assembly are done the shoddy work on the Electoral Act, and I take that with serious, I mean, uh, serious things, to say that in, in 185 a section bill, if you have issue only with one section, what percentage of issue, I mean, that you are listing in that context? Then taking the issue of cost referencing to the level of uh, a National Assembly doing shoddy job, we don't have any business bill here. If the, the bill, is not worthy of consideration, worthy of passage, I mean, into a piece. So I will say, rather, that the bar as to electoral credibility, electoral justice has been raised by the next assembly in regard to the bill that has been passed. As to we being in the house, uh, in the uh, in the recess for two months, it's also show part of lack of understanding of the work of the National Institute. I have been 
uh, in my constituency for constituency outreach, which is part of my work as a national legislator. So the fact that we're not sitting in Abuja does not mean that we're not working. So I think that it's also important that we must put that on uh, a, a purpose of public, I mean, electorate. And as to constituency theory, everywhere in the world, there's always we against them when it comes to government and these people who claim to be the people. We are also Nigerians and we represent, I mean, Nigeria. If there's any assemblage of people that can authoritatively speak on behalf of the Nigerian people, I think it's the National Assembly. We are not just there as Senator Atibola Bashiru or Honorable Benjamin Kalu. We are there as representative of constituencies that we represent. So when we get back to the National Assembly, the options we have cannot just be an option of a dictatorial tendency, which I saw from the last speaker, that you should just go and do this one. No, it doesn't work that way. All you right. will look at Senator, possibility if I, if of amending the quickly, bill or, or overriding the just veto moment, of Mr. President. Look at the options that we consider. Let, let, let me correct some of the uh, things you said. It is not only one drafting error. I have 10. I can pass it on 17. to 17. Yes, I am. But the question is that Nigerians, uh, your constituents, your constituent elected you. You know how tedious this job is when you can vast for votes. Nigerians are paying for this. If there are errors, as much as 17 the errors, officer. Nigerians are the I agree. I, I, ask you. I disagree. I, I totally disagree that there's error. I totally disagree. All right. On the copy of the bill that it says that there's no such error. Unfortunately, so let them bring, unfortunately let there will be much the time, from where there there be more time to go through all the 17 errors at this sitting. I what we are, what we are concerned the, with... What, which which fashion are you using? Is it the fashion of Yaga? Or the fashion that is with the National Assembly. Senator, so that must be a, that must be called, that will be a reference court. Senator, you cannot come uh, on national uh, television uh, and undermine the institution of National Assembly yeah, without fact and figure. So I challenge you, which copy are you using? Is it copy or is it the five copy of an NGO or the copy with the National Assembly the or the copy sent the to Mr. President? That, was made that was made must be a reference. It's become that a public be a document now, point. and we've been able to scrutinize it. It's not public document. It's which the public fact against you, Senator. The you document? may disagree with it. Who issued it to be the public document? Yeah, I think Senator. it's a serious matter that I have to take it up. All right. Yeah, I don't agree with you. We, we, we're going to be glad if you too. can take it up. Uh, it's for the interest of Nigerians. Let me allow the spokesperson of... But you can't, you can't, you can't undermine the institution of national sure democracy on the basis the of national assembly to document that we have not agreed on the process. Let's think the conversation us, tonight has been about the Nigerian people, about the Nigerian nation, about our Of course, I'm also a Nigerian, and, and I represent Nigeria. A critical question tonight, Senator. Um, let me allow the spokesperson of the House to come in here. Honorable, what are we expecting from you and your colleagues when you resume work on Tuesday? First of all, I want to, to calm down all of you because the town hall meeting is always like this. At some point, people will you know, be tense, but it's all about Nigerian project and we have to resolve it. Uh, let me mention this, that um, it is important for us to note that uh, the responsibility of bill scrutiny um, falls under what we call the legal services department. It's a, a bureaucratic office that services uh, policy makers and uh, they are part of National Assembly. You know, the National Assembly is sitting on the tripod. Uh, you have the legislature, the, the House of Rep and the Senate, and also you have the, the bureaucrats. So there is a role for them to play there with regards to fine tuning, pruning, um, you know, content that we have presented to them because the National Assembly members are not all skilled towards drafting. There is a department that handles that. Having said that, I want to also mention Question that honorable, the civil society, uh, the civil, civil society organization, the job of the civil society the organization. Law. So if there are errors in the legislation, yes, we're raising the question, and it's not me. That let, let, let me speak, let me so let me speak right. about the errors. Let me speak about the errors. I must commend the civil society organization who have been making efforts to make sure that uh, we see things from their own direction. Um, on the 29th of December, I received a letter from Yaga with regards to 
uh, some of the errors, we're talking about clause 24, sub 4, clause 50, sub 2, clause 64, uh, 7 and 8, sub 7 and 8, clause 91, sub 2, clause 107, sub 3, clause 137, sub 3, you know, well, and sub heads, paragraphs 4, 5, 6, paragraph 10, sub 2, paragraph 14, 2, paragraph 16, 3, and all the rest of them. We are partners in this Nigerian project. So what we have done, immediately I send it to the speaker to look at. And so All right. Honorable, apologies because we are totally out of time now. Uh, but um, because Asian Wangwagu sits on the board of Yaga, I, I would like you to, in 30 seconds, to speak about this cross-referencing error. Just in 30 seconds, please. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Honorable Kalu has dismissed the arrogance of Senator Ajibola Bashir. I, I think that... I think that... The issue of further consultation I, I and think spending money... I, I think it is, the rest I, of them. Sorry, we are not going to be I, I, think so it go is, go I think it is clear that the document that the president returned is not just in the custody of the National Assembly. It is that document that civil society scrutinized. And it's not just Yaga. The SGDM partners, civil society, came together, looked at those laws. And, and I feel very worried that Senator Ajibola Bashri will, will appropriate to himself the understanding of how the legislature works, when in reality, it's commonplace. Even if you didn't go to school, you, will, you should be able to understand that the legislative treadmill is such that has the component of the people in it. All right. And if the people are not in it, then your law has no validity. Thank you so much. We're totally out of time, and we need to wrap up now. I see that you wanted to yeah, raise something. Uh, uh, Just uh, quick, sh quickly. Yeah, Showing sh is then the truth of it is that we acknowledge to the fact that there were uh, cross-reference errors. We acknowledge even before now. And again, let me get to the, let me let the cat out of the bag that from the opposition uh, members of the House, on Tuesday, if nothing less than discussing the electoral bill on the floor of the House, we will not sit on the floor. We have Thank all discussed so that, Thank you so and much. that is what we are We've got your commitment, so, and we appreciate it. Yeah. We need to close now. Let me quickly bring on stage Dr. Husseini Abdul and Mr. Manjim Wilson. We're going to have just two minutes chat to close this, but I must sincerely thank uh, Mr. Uh, Ayuba Waba, the NSC President, Mr. Ezewa Wago, and Mr. Izuguza, Honorable Dachon Bangos. Thank you for being playing and coming straight with Nigerians tonight. And Mr. Anelbi, thank you so much for, for coming. Doc, Doc, please, could you quickly, quickly come? Thank Get you. a microphone, Mr. You can see, have you seen? We're just going to have. Uh, please come. Please come. We'll Let me. <laughs> see, come, come stand beside me here. Uh, and the conversation is very simple. Um, tonight, um, uh, you are on the board of Yaga, and you are of the EU, and you brought everyone into this room. Uh, what are your expectations, just briefly? Uh, well, Sean, I wouldn't say our expectations, but the expectations of Nigerians, as has been echoed through the voices of several speakers here, civil society partners and Nigerians, even on the street, as you, as you heard them speak earlier. I think the voice is one. The consensus is that Nigerians are desirous of an electoral law that is passed, and not just passed, but passed immediately. Uh, I think uh, the expectation is that when the National Assembly resumes on Tuesday, this should be the first, if not the only agenda on their plates until they are able to arrive at addressing some of the issues that have been spotlighted by uh, the, the various speakers here when we talk about the cross-referencing issues and the issues of um, reverting to status quo on the, for direct and indirect primaries or consensus, right. as the case is. Doc, going forward, what is the next line of action? Yeah, I think the next line of action uh, has already been set here, uh, that civil society organizations um, or the interest group, the labor, the media, communities, everyone need to exert pressure on the National Assembly and the president to actually consider this bill immediately, the urgency of now, ensuring that it is passed within the month and sent to the president for assent. And the president must recognize that this is, from Nigerian people, this is the last time the National Assembly will be sending a bill for its assent and that this should not be rejected, particularly this electoral act and the, 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 the electoral bill. So that's key. Number two for the National Assembly is to recognize that, look, 
from this conversation, there is almost a consensus that, yeah. look, we need to expunge the element around direct primaries, not because it is bad, but because it has become a distraction and we are probably not prepared for it. And therefore, we expunge it and prepare for the next time when we All may right. be considering that particular bill. Yeah. So for Nigerians, it's for us to recognize that this bill is arguably the most important bill in the country at the moment. Right. And we have to pass it now and ensure that we put every pressure on everyone that has a stake in this process. Dr. Hussein Abdul, thank you so much. Uh, Wilson Manji, thank you so much. But above all, it's you, Nigerians, uh, 200 million of you, who tonight have uh, stood in one voice to say, we need an election that Nigerians can be proud of. And on behalf of Yaga and every of the broadcasting organization tonight who have come together to put this together, I must salute your courage. And we stand together and hoping that the National Assembly and the politicians will do the right thing. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Shion Wakimale. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.